Chapter 24 Jesus went out from the temple and was going on his way. His disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all of these things, don't you? Most certainly I tell you, there will not be left here one stone on another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered them, Be careful that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will lead many astray. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you aren't troubled, for all this must happen, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, plagues, and earthquakes in various places. But all these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to oppression, and will kill you. You will be hated by all of the nations for my name's sake. Then many will stumble, and will deliver up one another and will hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will lead many astray. Because iniquity will be multiplied, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. This good news of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. When, therefore, you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take out the things that are in his house. Let him who is in the field not return back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are with child and to nursing mothers in those days. Pray that your flight will not be in the winter, nor on a Sabbath, for then there will be great suffering, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, nor ever will be. Unless those days had been shortened, no flesh would have been saved. But for the sake of the chosen ones, those days will be shortened. Then, if any man tells you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there, don't believe it. For there will arise false Christs and false prophets, and they will show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the chosen ones. Behold, I have told you beforehand, if, therefore, they tell you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, don't go out. Or, Behold, he is in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes from the east and is seen even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, that is where the vultures gather together. But immediately after the suffering of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his chosen ones from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Now, from the fig tree, learn this parable. When its branch has now become tender and produces its leaves, you know that the summer is near. Even so, you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Most certainly, I tell you, 
this generation will not pass away until all these things are accomplished. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But no one knows of that day and hour, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. As the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ship. And they didn't know until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Watch, therefore, for you don't know in what hour your Lord comes. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what watch of the night the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore also be ready, for in an hour that you don't expect, the Son of Man will come. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has set over his household to give them their food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord finds doing so when he comes. Most certainly I tell you that he will set him over all that he has. But if that evil servant should say in his heart, My Lord is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and eat and drink with the drunkards, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he doesn't expect it, and in an hour when he doesn't know it and will cut him in pieces and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. That is where the weeping and grinding of teeth will be. Chapter 25 Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Those who were foolish when they took their lamps, took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom delayed, they all slumbered and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, What if there isn't enough for us and you? You go, rather, to those who sell, and buy for yourselves. While they went away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Most certainly I tell you, I don't know you. Watch therefore, for you don't know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. For it is like a man going into another country who called his own servants and entrusted his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two to another one, to each according to his own ability. Then he went on his journey. Immediately he who received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. In the same way, he also who got the two gained another two. But he who received the one talent went away and dug in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Now after a long time the Lord of those servants came and reconciled accounts with them. He who received the five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Behold, I have gained another five talents in addition to them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
you have been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who got the two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Behold, I have gained another two talents in addition to them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you that you are a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow and gathering where you didn't scatter. I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the earth. Behold, you have what is yours. But his Lord answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I didn't sow and gather where I didn't scatter. You ought therefore to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received back my own with interest. Take away, therefore, the talent from him, and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to every one who has will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who doesn't have, even that which he has will be taken away. Throw out the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Before him all the nations will be gathered, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will tell those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for i was hungry and you gave me food to eat i was thirsty and you gave me drink i was a stranger and you took me in i was naked and you clothed me i was sick and you visited me i was in prison and you came to me then the righteous will answer him saying Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer them, Most certainly, I tell you, because you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say also to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. Naked, and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and didn't help you? Then he will answer them, saying, Most certainly I tell you, because you didn't do it to one of the least of these, you didn't do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Chapter 26 When Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests the scribes and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas. They took counsel together that they might take Jesus by deceit and kill him. But they said, 
not during the feast, lest a riot occur among the people. Now when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him, having an alabaster jar of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw this, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. However, knowing this, Jesus said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? She has done a good work for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you don't always have me. For in pouring this ointment on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Most certainly I tell you, wherever this good news is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of as a memorial of her. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me that I should deliver him to you? They weighed out for him thirty pieces of silver. From that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain person and tell him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus commanded them and they prepared the Passover. Now when evening had come, he was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. As they were eating, he said, Most certainly I tell you that one of you will betray me. They were exceedingly sorrowful, and each began to ask him, It isn't me, is it, Lord? He answered, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man goes, even as it is written of him. But woe to that man through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who betrayed him, answered, It isn't me, is it, Rabbi? He said to him, You said it. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks for it, and broke it. He gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup, gave thanks, and gave to them, saying, All of you drink it, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. But I tell you that I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on, until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me tonight, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter answered him, Even if all will be made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Most certainly I tell you that tonight, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. All of the disciples also said likewise, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and severely troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went forward a little fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not what I desire, 
but what you desire. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Couldn't you watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, My father, if this cup can't pass away from me unless I drink it, your desire be done. He came again and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. He left them again, went away, and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let's be going. Behold, he who betrays me is at hand. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whoever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, why are you here? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and struck off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take the sword will die by the sword. Or do you think that I couldn't ask my father, and he would even now send me more than twelve legions of angels? How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? In that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to seize me? I sat daily in the temple teaching, and you didn't arrest me. But all this has happened that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Those who had taken Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter followed him from a distance to the court of the high priest and entered in and sat with the officers to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and the whole council sought false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death and they found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, Have you no answer? What is this that these testify against you? But Jesus held his peace. The high priest answered him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said it. Nevertheless, I tell you, after this you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of the sky. Then the high priest tore his clothing saying, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Behold, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, He is worthy of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who hid you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the court, and a maid came to him, saying, You were also with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you are talking about. When he had gone out onto the porch, someone else saw him and said to those who were there, 
This man also was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those who stood by came and said to Peter, Surely you are also one of them, for your speech makes you known. Then he began to curse and to swear, I don't know the man. Immediately the rooster crowed. Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Then he went out and wept bitterly. Chapter 27 Now when morning had come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away, and delivered him up to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, who betrayed him, when he saw that Jesus was condemned, felt remorse, and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I betrayed innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? You see to it. He threw down the pieces of silver in the sanctuary and departed. He went away and hanged himself. The chief priests took the pieces of silver and said, It's not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is the price of blood. They took counsel and bought the potter's field with them to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field was called the field of blood to this day. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, saying, They took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him upon whom a price had been set, whom some of the children of Israel priced, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, So you say. When he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Don't you hear how many things they testify against you? He gave him no answer, not even one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Now, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release to the multitude one prisoner, whom they desired. They had then a notable prisoner, called Barabbas. When, therefore, they were gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that because of envy they had delivered him up. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. But the governor answered them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas! Pilate said to them, What then shall I do to Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. But the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out exceedingly, saying, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that nothing was being gained, but rather that a disturbance was starting, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this righteous person. You see to it. All the people answered, May his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released to them Barabbas. But Jesus he flogged and delivered to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium, and gathered the whole garrison together against him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They braided a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and a reed in his right hand. And they kneeled down before him and mocked him, saying, 
Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. When they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled him to go with them that he might carry his cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of a skull, they gave him sour wine to drink mixed with gall. When he had tasted it, he would not drink. When they had crucified him, they divided his clothing among them, casting lots, and they sat and watched him there. They set up over his head the accusation against him, written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then there were two robbers crucified with him, one on his right hand and one on the left. Those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking, with the scribes, the Pharisees, and the elders, said, He saved others, but he can't save himself. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The robbers also, who were crucified with him, cast on him the same reproach. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of them who stood there when they heard it said, This man is calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. The rest said, Let him be. Let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered into the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him watching Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were done, feared exceedingly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Many women were there, watching from afar, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, serving him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When evening had come, a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who himself was also Jesus' disciple, came. This man went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given up. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. Now on the next day, which was the day after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees were gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember what that deceiver said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest perhaps his disciples come at night and steal him away and tell the people he is risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go, make it as secure as you can. 
So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone. Chapter 28 Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from the sky and came and rolled away the stone from the door and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. The angel answered the women, Don't be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just like he said. Come, see the place where the Lord was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead, and behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. They departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring his disciples word. As they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! They came and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers that they should go into Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guards came into the city, and told the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave a large amount of silver to the soldiers, saying, Say that his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and make you free of worry. So they took the money and did as they were told. This saying was spread abroad among the Jews and continues until today. But the eleven disciples went into Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had sent them. When they saw him, they bowed down to him, but some doubted. Jesus came to them and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Mark Chapter 1 the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness, and preaching the baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. All the country of Judea and all those of Jerusalem went out to him. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and loosen. I baptized you in water, but he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. A voice came out of the sky. You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. 
Immediately, the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. He was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels were serving him. Now, after John was taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the good news of God's kingdom and saying, The time is fulfilled, and God's kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Passing along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you into fishers for men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and went after him. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as having authority and not as the scribes. Immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Ha! What do we have to do with you, Jesus, you Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? I know you, who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. The unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. The report of him went out immediately everywhere into all the region of Galilee and its surrounding area. Immediately, when they had come out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. He came and took her by the hand and raised her up, the fever left her immediately, and she served them. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were possessed by demons. All the city was gathered together at the door. He healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. He didn't allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, he rose up and went out and departed into a deserted place and prayed there. Simon and those who were with him searched for him. They found him and told him, Everyone is looking for you. He said to them, Let's go elsewhere into the next towns that I may preach there also, because I came out for this reason. He went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. A leper came to him, begging him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you want to, you can make me clean. Being moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I want to be made clean. When he had said this, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was made clean. He strictly warned him, and immediately sent him out, and said to him, See, you say nothing to anybody, but go show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing the things which Moses commanded for a testimony to them. But he went out, and began to proclaim it much, and to spread about the matter, so that Jesus could no more openly enter into a city, but was outside in desert places. People came to him from everywhere.
Chapter 2 When he entered again into Capernaum after some days, it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even around the door. And he spoke the word to them. Four people came, carrying a paralytic to him. When they could not come near to him for the crowd, they removed the roof where he was. When they had broken it up, they let down the mat that the paralytic was lying on. Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. But there were some of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like that? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, said to them, Why do you reason these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to tell the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Arise, and take up your bed, and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, arise, take up your mat, and go to your house. He arose, and immediately took up the mat, and went out in front of them all, so that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. He went out again by the seaside. All the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. He was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners sat down with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. The scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are healthy have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came and asked him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? Jesus said to them, Can the groomsmen fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they can't fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the patch shrinks and the new tears away from the old, and a worse hole is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the skins, and the wine pours out, and the skins will be destroyed but they put new wine into fresh wineskins. He was going on the Sabbath day through the grain fields, and his disciples began, as they went, to pluck the ears of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Behold, why do they do that which is not lawful on the Sabbath day? He said to them, Did you never read what David did when he had need and was hungry? he and those who were with him, how he entered into God's house at the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and gave also to those who were with him. He said to them, This Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Chapter 3 He entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there who had his hand withered. They watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. He said to the man who had his hand withered, 
Stand up. He said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. When he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved at the hardening of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored as healthy as the other. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude followed him from Galilee, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from Idumea, beyond the Jordan, and those from around Tyre and Sidon. A great multitude, hearing what great things he did, came to him. He spoke to his disciples that a little boat should stay near him because of the crowd, so that they wouldn't press on him. For he had healed many, so that as many as had diseases pressed on him that they might touch him. The unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried, You are the Son of God! He sternly warned them that they should not make him known. He went up into the mountain and called to himself those whom he wanted, and they went to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to heal sicknesses, and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, whom he called Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Then he came into a house. The multitude came together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. When his friends heard it, they went out to seize him, for they said, He is insane. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the prince of the demons, he casts out the demons. He summoned them and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he can't stand but has an end. But no one can enter into the house of the strong man to plunder unless he first binds the strong man. Then he will plunder his house. Most certainly, I tell you, all sins of the descendants of man will be forgiven, including their blasphemies with which they may blaspheme. But whoever may blaspheme against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said, He has an unclean spirit. His mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. A multitude was sitting around him, and they told him, Behold, your mother, your brothers, and your sisters are outside looking for you. He answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking around at those who sat around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, and mother. Chapter 4 Again he began to teach by the seaside. A great multitude was gathered to him, so that he entered into a boat in the sea and sat down. All the multitude were on the land by the sea. He taught them many things in parables and told them in his teaching. Listen, behold, the farmer went out to sow, and as he sowed, 
Some seed fell by the road, and the birds came and devoured it. Others fell on the rocky ground, where it had little soil, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of soil. When the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Others fell into the good ground and yielded fruit, growing up and increasing. Some produced thirty times, some sixty times, and some one hundred times as much. He said, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, those who were around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. He said to them, To you is given the mystery of God's kingdom, but to those who are outside, all things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest perhaps they should turn again, and their sins should be forgiven them. He said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How will you understand all of the parables? The farmer sows the word. The ones by the road are the ones where the word is sown, and when they have heard, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. These in the same way are those who are sown on the rocky places, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with joy. They have no root in themselves, but are short-lived. When oppression or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they stumble. Others are those who are sown among the thorns. These are those who have heard the word and the cares of this age and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Those which are sown on the good ground are those who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, some thirty times, some sixty times, and some one hundred times. He said to them, Is the lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Isn't it put on a stand? For there is nothing hidden except that it should be made known. Neither was anything made secret, but that it should come to light. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. He said to them, Take heed what you hear. With whatever measure you measure, it will be measured to you, and more will be given to you who hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he who doesn't have, even that which he has will be taken away from him. He said, God's kingdom is as if a man should cast seed on the earth and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow, though he doesn't know how. For the earth bears fruit, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the fruit is ripe, Immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. He said, How will we liken God's kingdom? Or with what parable will we illustrate it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the earth, though it is less than all the seeds that are on the earth, yet when it is sown, grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs, and puts out great branches so that the birds of the sky can lodge under its shadow. With many such parables he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. Without a parable he didn't speak to them, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let's go over to the other side. Leaving the multitude, they took him with them even as he was, in the boat. Other small boats were also with him. A big windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so much that the boat was already filled. 
he himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and told him, Teacher, don't you care that we are dying? He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? How is it that you have no faith? They were greatly afraid and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Chapter 5 They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. When he had come out of the boat, immediately a man with an unclean spirit met him out of the tombs. He lived in the tombs. Nobody could bind him any more, not even with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Nobody had the strength to tame him. Always, night and day, in the tombs and in the mountains, he was crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and bowed down to him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, you son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, don't torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. He asked him, What is your name? He said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now on the mountainside there was a great herd of pigs feeding. All the demons begged him, saying, Send us into the pigs, that we may enter into them. At once Jesus gave them permission. The unclean spirits came out and entered into the pigs. The herd of about two thousand rushed down the steep bank into the sea, and they were drowned in the sea. Those who fed them fled and told it in the city and in the country. The people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw him who had been possessed by demons, sitting, clothed, and in his right mind, even him who had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who saw it declared to them what happened to him who was possessed by demons and about the pigs. They began to beg him to depart from their region. As he was entering into the boat, he who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. He didn't allow him, but said to him, Go to your house, to your friends, and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. He went his way and began to proclaim in Decapolis how Jesus had done great things for him, and everyone marveled. When Jesus had crossed back over in the boat to the other side, a great multitude was gathered to him, and he was by the sea. Behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, came, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and begged him much, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her, that she may be made healthy and live. He went with him, and a great multitude followed him, and they pressed upon him on all sides. A certain woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years and had suffered many things by many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse, having heard the things concerning Jesus, came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. For she said, If I just touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, 
perceiving in himself that the power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the multitude pressing against you, and you say, Who touched me? He looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had been done to her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be cured of your disease. While he was still speaking, people came from the synagogue ruler's house, saying, Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher any more? But Jesus, when he heard the message spoken, immediately said to the ruler of the synagogue, Don't be afraid, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. He came to the synagogue ruler's house, and he saw an uproar, weeping and great wailing. When he had entered in, he said to them, Why do you make an uproar and weep? The child is not dead, but is asleep. They ridiculed him. But he, having put them all out, took the father of the child, her mother, and those who were with him, and went in where the child was lying. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumai, which means being interpreted, Girl, I tell you, get up. Immediately the girl rose up and walked, for she was twelve years old. They were amazed with great amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this, and commanded that something should be given to her to eat. Chapter 6 He went out from there. He came into his own country and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is the wisdom that is given to this man, that such mighty works come about by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? They were offended at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, and among his own relatives, and in his own house. He could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He marveled because of their unbelief. He went around the villages teaching, he called to himself the twelve, and began to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, except a staff only, no bread, no wallet, no money in their purse, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter into a house, Stay there until you depart from there. Whoever will not receive you nor hear you, as you depart from there, shake off the dust that is under your feet for a testimony against them. Assuredly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. They went out and preached that people should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard this, for his name had become known, and he said, John the Baptizer has risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. But others said, He is Elijah. Others said, He is a prophet, or like one of the prophets. But Herod, when he heard this, said, This is John, whom I beheaded. He has risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent out and arrested John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. 
For John said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias set herself against him and desired to kill him, but she couldn't. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe. When he heard him, he did many things, and he heard him gladly. Then a convenient day came that Herod on his birthday made a supper for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and those sitting with him. The king said to the young lady, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He swore to her, Whatever you shall ask of me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? She said, The head of John the baptizer. She came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, I want you to give me right now the head of John the baptizer on a platter. The king was exceedingly sorry, but for the sake of his oaths and of his dinner guests, he didn't wish to refuse her. Immediately the king sent out a soldier of his guard and commanded to bring John's head, and he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the young lady, and the young lady gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard this, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. The apostles gathered themselves together to Jesus, and they told him all things, whatever they had done and whatever they had taught. He said to them, You, come apart into a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. They went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. They saw them going, and many recognized him, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them, and came together to him. Jesus came out, saw a great multitude, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When it was late in the day, his disciples came to him and said, This place is deserted, and it is late in the day. Send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. They asked him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? He said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go see. When they knew, they said, Five and two fish. He commanded them that everyone should sit down in groups on the green grass. They sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and, looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves, and he gave to his disciples to set before them, and he divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were filled. They took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and also of the fish. Those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat, and to go ahead to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he himself sent the multitude away. After he had taken leave of them, he went up the mountain to pray. When evening had come, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Seeing them distressed and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them, about the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. And he would have passed by them, but they, when they saw him walking on the sea, supposed that it was a ghost, and cried out, for they all saw him, and were troubled. But he immediately spoke with them, and said to them, Cheer up, it is I, don't be afraid. He got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were very amazed among themselves, and marveled. 
for they hadn't understood about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. When they had come out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran around that whole region and began to bring those who were sick on their mats to where they heard he was. Wherever he entered, into villages or into cities or into the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched him were made well. Chapter 7 Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eating bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat unless they wash their hands and forearms, holding to the tradition of the elders. They don't eat when they come from the marketplace unless they bathe themselves. And there are many other things which they have received to hold to, washings of cups, pitchers, bronze vessels, and couches. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why don't your disciples walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with unwashed hands? He answered them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But they worship me in vain teaching us doctrines, the commandments of men. For you set aside the commandment of God and hold tightly to the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and you do many other such things. He said to them, Full well do you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and... He who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is to say, given to God, then you no longer allow him to do anything for his father or his mother, making void the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down. You do many things like this. He called all the multitude to himself and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing from outside of the man that going into him can defile him. But the things which proceed out of the man are those that defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered into a house away from the multitude, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, Are you also without understanding? Don't you perceive that whatever goes into the man from outside can't defile him, because it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, then into the latrine, making all foods clean? He said, That which proceeds out of the man, that defiles the man. For from within, out of the hearts of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, sexual sins, murders, thefts, covetings, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. From there he arose and went away into the borders of Tyre and Sidon. He entered into a house and didn't want anyone to know it, but he couldn't escape notice. For a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, having heard of him, came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by race. She begged him that he would cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the little children be filled first, for it is not appropriate to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, 
Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. He said to her, For this saying, Go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. She went away to her house and found the child having been laid on the bed with the demon gone out. Again he departed from the borders of Tyre and Sidon and came to the Sea of Galilee through the middle of the region of Decapolis. They brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. They begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside from the multitude privately and put his fingers into his ears and he spat and touched his tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was released, and he spoke clearly. He commanded them that they should tell no one, but the more he commanded them, so much the more widely they proclaimed it. They were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes even the deaf hear and the mute speak. Chapter 8 In those days, when there was a very great multitude, and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to himself and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have stayed with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away fasting to their home, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come a long way. His disciples answered him, From where could one satisfy these people with bread here in a deserted place? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. He commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves. Having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to serve. And they served the multitude. They had a few small fish. Having blessed them, he said to serve these also. They ate and were filled. They took up seven baskets of broken pieces that were left over. Those who had eaten were about four thousand. Then he sent them away. Immediately he entered into the boat with his disciples and came into the region of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came out and began to question him, seeking from him a sign from heaven and testing him. He sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Most certainly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. He left them and again, entering into the boat, departed to the other side. They forgot to take bread, and they didn't have more than one loaf in the boat with them. He warned them, saying, Take heed, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. They reasoned with one another, saying, It's because we have no bread. Jesus, perceiving it, said to them, why do you reason that it's because you have no bread? Don't you perceive yet, neither understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, don't you see? Having ears, don't you hear? Don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves among the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They told him, Twelve. When the seven loaves fed the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They told him, Seven. He asked them, Don't you understand yet? He came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took hold of the blind man by the hand and brought him out of the village. When he had spat on his eyes, and laid his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. He looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking. Then again he laid his hands on his eyes. He looked intently and was restored and saw everyone clearly. 
he sent him away to his house, saying, Don't enter into the village, nor tell anyone in the village. Jesus went out with his disciples into the villages of Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? They told him, John the baptizer, and others say Elijah, but others one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. He commanded them that they should tell no one about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke to them openly. Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But he, turning around and seeing his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you have in mind not the things of God, but the things of men. He called the multitude to himself with his disciples and said to them, Whoever wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake and the sake of the good news will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what will a man give in exchange for his life? For whoever will be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man also will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Chapter 9 he said to them, Most certainly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will in no way taste death until they see God's kingdom come with power. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and brought them up onto a high mountain privately by themselves, and he was changed into another form in front of them. His clothing became glistening, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launderer on earth could whiten them. Elijah and Moses appeared to them, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter answered Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he didn't know what to say for they were very afraid. A cloud came, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they saw no one with them anymore except Jesus only. As they were coming down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one what things they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept this saying to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. They asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah indeed comes first and restores all things. How is it written about the Son of Man? that he should suffer many things and be despised? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they have also done to him whatever they wanted to, even as it is written about him. Coming to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, and scribes questioning them. Immediately all the multitude, when they saw him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, greeted him. He asked the scribes, What are you asking them? One of the multitude answered, Teacher, I brought to you my son, who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams at the mouth, and grinds his teeth, and wastes away. I asked your disciples to cast it out, 
and they weren't able. He answered him, Unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. They brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground, wallowing and foaming at the mouth. He asked his father, How long has it been since this has come to him? He said, From childhood. Often it has cast him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out with tears, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a multitude came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him greatly, it came out of him. The boy became like one dead, so much that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up, and he arose. When he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we cast it out? He said to them, This kind can come out by nothing except by prayer and fasting. They went out from there and passed through Galilee. He didn't want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being handed over to the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, on the third day he will rise again. But they didn't understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. He came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing among yourselves on the way? But they were silent for they had disputed with one another on the way about who was the greatest. He sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If any man wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. He took a little child and set him in the middle of them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such little child in my name receives me and whoever receives me doesn't receive me, but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone who doesn't follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he doesn't follow us. But Jesus said, Don't forbid him, for there is no one who will do a mighty work in my name and be able quickly to speak evil of me. For whoever is not against us is on our side. For whoever will give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you are Christ's, most certainly I tell you, he will in no way lose his reward. Whoever will cause one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if he were thrown into the sea with a millstone hung around his neck. If your hand causes you to stumble, Cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having your two hands to go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire, where their worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life lame rather than having your two feet to be cast into Gehenna, into the fire that will never be quenched where their worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, cast it out. It is better for you to enter into God's kingdom with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into the Gehenna of fire, where their worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, 
but if the salt has lost its saltiness with what will you season it have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another chapter ten he arose from there and came into the borders of judea and beyond the jordan multitudes came together to him again as he usually did he was again teaching them pharisees came to him testing him and asked him is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife he answered what did moses command you they said moses allowed a certificate of divorce to be written and to divorce her but jesus said to them for your hardness of heart he wrote you this commandment but from the beginning of the creation god made them male and female for this cause a man will leave his father and mother and will join to his wife and the two will become one flesh so that they are no longer two but one flesh what therefore god has joined together let no man separate in the house his disciples asked him again about the same matter he said to them whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her if a woman herself divorces her husband and marries another she commits adultery they were bringing to him little children that he should touch them but the disciples rebuked those who were bringing them but when jesus saw it he was moved with indignation and said to them allow the little children to come to me don't forbid them for god's kingdom belongs to such as these most certainly i tell you whoever will not receive god's kingdom like a little child he will in no way enter into it he took them in his arms and blessed them laying his hands on them as he was going out into the way one ran to him knelt before him and asked him good teacher what shall i do that i may inherit eternal life jesus said to him why do you call me good no one is good except one god you know the commandments do not murder do not commit adultery do not steal do not give false testimony do not defraud honor your father and mother he said to him teacher i have observed all these things from my youth jesus looking at him loved him and said to him one thing you lack go sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me taking up the cross but his face fell at that saying and he went away sorrowful for he was one who had great possessions jesus looked around and said to his disciples how difficult it is for those who have riches to enter into god's kingdom the disciples were amazed at his words but jesus answered again children how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter into god's kingdom it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into god's kingdom they were exceedingly astonished saying to him then who can be saved jesus looking at them said with men it is impossible but not with god for all things are possible with god peter began to tell him behold we have left all and have followed you jesus said most certainly i tell you there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake and for the sake of the good news but he will receive one hundred times more now in this time houses brothers sisters mothers children and land with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last first they were on the way 
going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was going in front of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He again took the twelve, and began to tell them the things that were going to happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death, and will deliver him to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, scourge him, and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came near to him, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we will ask. He said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant to us that we may sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. Jesus said to them, You shall indeed drink the cup that I drink and you shall be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand and at my left hand is not mine to give, but for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard it, they began to be indignant toward James and John. Jesus summoned them and said to them, You know that they who are recognized as rulers over the nations lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever wants to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever of you wants to become first among you shall be bondservant of all. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. They came to Jericho, as he went out from Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, the son of Timaeus, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, you son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him that he should be quiet, but he cried out much more. You son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him. They called the blind man, saying to him, Cheer up, get up, he is calling you. He, casting away his cloak, sprang up and came to Jesus. Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni that I may see again. Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the way. Chapter 11 When they came near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go your way into the village that is opposite you. Immediately as you enter into it, you will find the young donkey tied, on which no one has sat. Untie him and bring him. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs him, and immediately he will send him back here. They went away and found a young donkey tied at the door outside in the open street, and they untied him. Some of those who stood there asked them, What are you doing, untying the young donkey? They said to them as Jesus had said, and they let them go. They brought the young donkey to Jesus and threw their garments on it, and Jesus sat on it. Many spread their garments on the way, and others were cutting down branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Those who went in front and those who followed cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
Jesus entered into the temple in Jerusalem. When he looked around at everything, it being now evening, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came to see if perhaps he might find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Jesus told it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. They came to Jerusalem, and Jesus entered into the temple and began to throw out those who sold and those who bought in the temple and overthrew the money changers' tables and the seats of those who sold the doves. He would not allow anyone to carry a container through the temple. He taught, saying to them, Isn't it written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the scribes heard it, and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. When evening came, he went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away from the roots. Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God, for most certainly I tell you, whoever may tell this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is happening, he shall have whatever he says. Therefore I tell you, all things whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you have received them, and you shall have them. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, who is in heaven, may also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your transgressions. They came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him, and they began saying to him, by what authority do you do these things? Or who gave you this authority to do these things? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. They reasoned with themselves, saying, If we should say, from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? If we should say, from men, they feared the people, for all held John to really be a prophet. They answered Jesus, We don't know. Jesus said to them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. Chapter 12 He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug a pit for the winepress, built a tower, rented it out to a farmer, and went into another country. When it was time, he sent a servant to the farmer to get from the farmer his share of the fruit of the vineyard. They took him, beat him, and sent him away empty. Again he sent another servant to them, and they threw stones at him wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. Again he sent another, and they killed him, and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one, his beloved son, he sent him last to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those farmers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. They took him, killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. What, therefore, will the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the farmers, and will give the vineyard to others. 
Haven't you even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected was made the head of the corner. This was from the Lord. It is marvelous in our eyes. They tried to seize him, but they feared the multitude, for they perceived that he spoke the parable against them. They left him and went away. They sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to him, that they might trap him with words. When they had come, they asked him, Teacher, we know that you are honest and don't defer to anyone, for you aren't partial to anyone, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius, that I may see it. They brought it. He said to them, Whose is this image and inscription? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus answered them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. They marveled greatly at him. Some Sadducees, who say that there is no resurrection, came to him. They asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us, If a man's brother dies and leaves a wife behind him and leaves no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying left no offspring. The second took her and died, leaving no children behind him. The third likewise, and the seven took her and left no children. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be of them? For the seven had her as a wife. Jesus answered them, isn't this because you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they will rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But about the dead, that they are raised. Haven't you read in the book of Moses about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are therefore badly mistaken. One of the scribes came and heard them questioning together, and knowing that he had answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the greatest of all? Jesus answered, The greatest is, Hear, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, Truly, teacher, you have said well that he is one, and there is none other but he and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from God's kingdom. No one dared ask him any question after that. Jesus responded as he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said in the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool of your feet. Therefore David himself calls him Lord. So how can he be his son? The common people heard him gladly. In his teaching he said to them, Beware of the scribes who like to walk in long robes and to get greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the best places at feasts 
those who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and saw how the multitude cast money into the treasury. Many who were rich cast in much. A poor widow came, and she cast in two small brass coins, which equal a quadrans coin. He called his disciples to him and said to them, Most certainly I tell you, this poor widow gave more than all those who are giving into the treasury. For they all gave out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, gave all that she had to live on. Chapter 13 As he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what kind of stones and what kind of buildings. Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone on another which will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? What is the sign that these things are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus, answering, began to tell them, Be careful that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be troubled, for those must happen, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines and troubles. These things are the beginning of birth pains. But watch yourselves for they will deliver you up to councils. You will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. The good news must first be preached to all the nations. When they lead you away and deliver you up, don't be anxious beforehand or premeditate what you will say, but say whatever will be given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak but the Holy Spirit. Brother will deliver up brother to death, and the father his child. Children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all men for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him who is on the housetop not go down nor enter in to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not return back to take his cloak. But woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babies in those days. Pray that your flight won't be in the winter, for in those days there will be oppression, such as there has not been the like from the beginning of the creation which God created until now, and never will be. Unless the Lord had shortened the days, no flesh would have been saved. But for the sake of the chosen ones whom he picked out, he shortened the days. Then if anyone tells you, Look, here is the Christ, or Look, there, don't believe it, for there will arise false Christs and false prophets, and will show signs and wonders, that they may lead astray, if possible, even the chosen ones. But you, watch. Behold, I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after that oppression, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from the sky, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out his angels and will gather together his chosen ones from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the sky. 
Now, from the fig tree, learn this parable. When the branch has now become tender and produces its leaves, you know that the summer is near. Even so, you also, when you see these things coming to pass, know that it is near, at the doors. Most certainly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Watch, keep alert, and pray, for you don't know when the time is. It is like a man traveling to another country, having left his house and given authority to his servants and to each one his work, and also commanded the doorkeeper to keep watch. Watch, therefore, for you don't know when the Lord of the house is coming, whether at evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he might find you sleeping. What I tell you, I tell all. Watch. Chapter 14 It was now two days before the feast of the Passover and the unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might seize him by deception and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, because there might be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came, having an alabaster jar of ointment of pure nard, very costly. She broke the jar and poured it over his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves, saying, Why has this ointment been wasted? for this might have been sold for more than three hundred denarii and given to the poor. So they grumbled against her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me, for you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want to, you can do them good. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burying. Most certainly, I tell you, wherever this good news may be preached throughout the whole world, that which this woman has done will also be spoken of for a memorial of her. Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went away to the chief priests that he might deliver him to them. They, when they heard it, were glad and promised to give him money. He sought how he might conveniently deliver him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover, his disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and there you will meet a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters in, tell the master of the house. The teacher says, Where is the guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will himself show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Get ready for us there. His disciples went out and came into the city, and found things as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. As they sat and were eating, Jesus said, Most certainly I tell you, one of you will betray me, he who eats with me. They began to be sorrowful and to ask him one by one, Surely not I. And another said, Surely not I. He answered them, It is one of the twelve, he who dips with me in the dish. For the Son of Man goes, even as it is written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had blessed, he broke it, and gave to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. 
he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave to them. They all drank of it. He said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Most certainly, I tell you, I will no more drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in God's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me tonight, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. However, after I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said to him, Although all will be offended, yet I will not. Jesus said to him, Most certainly I tell you, that you today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke all the more, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. They all said the same thing. They came to a place which was named Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be greatly troubled and distressed. He said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass away from him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Please remove this cup from me. However, not what I desire, but what you desire. He came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Couldn't you watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. Again he returned and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they didn't know what to answer him. He came the third time and said to them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise. Let's get going. Behold, he who betrays me is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now he who betrayed him had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I will kiss, that is he. Seize him and lead him away safely. When he had come, immediately he came to him and said, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. They laid their hands on him and seized him. But a certain one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Jesus answered them, Have you come out as against a robber? with swords and clubs to seize me? I was daily with you in the temple, teaching, and you didn't arrest me. But this is so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. They all left him and fled. A certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around himself over his naked body. The young men grabbed him, but he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. They led Jesus away to the high priest. All the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes came together with him. Peter had followed him from a distance until he came into the court of the high priest. He was sitting with the officers and warming himself in the light of the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council sought witnesses against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony didn't agree with each other. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, 
I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. Even so, their testimony didn't agree. The high priest stood up in the middle and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it which these testify against you? But he stayed quiet and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of the sky. The high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need have we of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him to be worthy of death. Some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to beat him with fists and to tell him, Prophesy! The officers struck him with the palms of their hands. As Peter was in the courtyard below, one of the maids of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You were also with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. He went out on the porch, and the rooster crowed. The maid saw him and began again to tell those who stood by, This is one of them. But he again denied it. After a little while, again those who stood by said to Peter, You truly are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. But he began to curse and to swear, I don't know this man of whom you speak. The rooster crowed the second time. Peter remembered the word, how that Jesus said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. When he thought about that, he wept. Chapter 15 Immediately in the morning the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council held a consultation, bound Jesus, carried him away, and delivered him up to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, So you say. The chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate again asked him, have you no answer? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast he used to release to them one prisoner, whom they asked of him. There was one called Barabbas, bound with his fellow insurgents, men who in the insurrection had committed murder. The multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do as he always did for them. Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that, for envy, the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the multitude, that he should release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate again asked them, What then should I do to him whom you call the king of the Jews. They cried out again, Crucify, Crucify him. him! Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out exceedingly, Crucify, Crucify him! him! Pilate, wishing to please the multitude, released Barabbas to them and handed over Jesus when he had flogged him to be crucified. The soldiers led him away within the court which is the praetorium, and they called together the whole cohort. They clothed him with purple, and, weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on him. They began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing their knees, did homage to him. When they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, and put his own garments on him. They led him out to crucify him. They compelled one passing by, coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, 
to go with them, that he might bear his cross. They brought him to the place called Golgotha, which is, being interpreted, the place of a skull. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh to drink, but he didn't take it. Crucifying him, they parted his garments among them, casting lots on them, what each should take. It was the third hour, and they crucified him. The superscription of his accusation was written over him, The King of the Jews. With him they crucified two robbers, one on his right hand and one on his left. The scripture was fulfilled, which says he was counted with transgressors. Those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said, He saved others. He can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross, that we may see and believe him. Those who were crucified with him also insulted him. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by, when they heard it, said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. One ran, and filling a sponge full of vinegar, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Let him be. Let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and gave up the spirit. The veil of the temple was torn in two, from the top to the bottom. When the centurion, who stood by opposite him, saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women watching from afar, among whom were both Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Less, and of Joseph, and Salome, who, when he was in Galilee, followed him and served him and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had now come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who also himself was looking for God's kingdom, came. He boldly went in to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate marveled if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead long. When he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. He bought a linen cloth, and taking him down, wound him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been cut out of a rock. He rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Chapter 16 When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? for it was very big. Looking up, they saw that the stone was rolled back. Entering into the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were amazed. He said to them, Don't be amazed. You seek Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he goes before you into Galilee. There you will see him, 
as he said to you. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come on them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he had risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him, as they mourned and wept. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they disbelieved. After these things, he was revealed in another form to two of them, as they walked on their way into the country. They went away and told it to the rest. They didn't believe them either. Afterward, he was revealed to the eleven themselves as they sat at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they didn't believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved but he who disbelieves will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new languages. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will in no way hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then the Lord, after he had spoken to them, was received up into heaven, and sat down at the right hand of God. They went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word by the signs that followed. Amen. Luke Chapter 1 since many have undertaken to set in order a narrative concerning those matters which have been fulfilled among us, even as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having traced the course of all things accurately from the first, to write to you in order, most excellent Theophilus, that you might know the certainty concerning the things in which you were instructed, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the priestly division of Abijah. He had a wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren and they both were well advanced in years. Now while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to enter into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zacharias, because your request has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine, nor strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to prepare a people prepared for the Lord. Zacharias said to the angel, How can I be sure of this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you 
and to bring you this good news. Behold, you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day that these things will happen, because you didn't believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The people were waiting for Zacharias, and they marveled that he delayed in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. He continued making signs to them and remained mute. When the days of his service were fulfilled, he departed to his house. After these days, Elizabeth, his wife, conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus has the Lord done to me in the days in which he looked at me, to take away my reproach among men. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man whose name was Joseph of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. Having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, you highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was greatly troubled at the saying, and considered what kind of salutation this might be. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and will call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, seeing I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is born from you will be called the Son of God. Behold, Elizabeth, your relative, also has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing spoken by God is impossible. Mary said, Behold, the servant of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. The angel departed from her. Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She called out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the voice of your greeting came into my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of the things which have been spoken to her from the Lord. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has looked at the humble state of his servant. For, behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy is for generations of generations on those who fear him. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down princes from their thrones and has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. He has given help to Israel, his servant, that he might remember mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring, forever. Mary stayed with her about three months, 
and then returned to her house. Now the time that Elizabeth should give birth was fulfilled, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had magnified his mercy toward her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zacharias, after the name of his father. His mother answered, Not so, but he will be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. They made signs to his father, what he would have him called. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. They all marveled. His mouth was opened immediately and his tongue freed and he spoke, blessing God. Fear came on all who lived around them, and all these sayings were talked about throughout all the hill country of Judea. All who heard them laid them up in their heart, saying, What then will this child be? The hand of the Lord was with him. His father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been from of old. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy toward our fathers to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, to grant to us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, should serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the face of the Lord, to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child was growing and becoming strong in spirit, and was in the desert until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Chapter 2 Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to enroll themselves, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to David's city, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, to enroll himself with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him as wife, being pregnant. While they were there, the day had come for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son, she wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a feeding trough because there was no room for them in the inn. There were shepherds in the same country staying in the field and keeping watch by night over their flock. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. The angel said to them, don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all the people. For there is born to you today, in David's city, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This is the sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a feeding trough. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, 
goodwill toward men. When the angels went away from them into the sky, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem now and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They came with haste and found both Mary and Joseph, and the baby was lying in the feeding trough. When they saw it, they publicized widely the saying which was spoken to them about this child. All who heard it wondered at the things which were spoken to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these sayings, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, just as it was told them. When eight days were fulfilled for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the days of their purification, according to the law of Moses, were fulfilled, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death, before he had seen the Lord's Christ. He came in the Spirit into the temple. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, that they might do concerning him according to the custom of the law, then he received him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now you are releasing your servant, Master, according to your word, in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light for revelation to the nations, and the glory of your people, Israel. Joseph and his mother were marveling at the things which were spoken concerning him, and Simeon blessed them, and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which is spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age having lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and she had been a widow for about eighty-four years, who didn't depart from the temple, worshipping with fastings and petitions night and day. Coming up at that very hour, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who were looking for redemption in Jerusalem. When they had accomplished all things that were according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. The child was growing and was becoming strong in spirit, being filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went every year to Jerusalem at the feast of the Passover. When he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast, and when they had fulfilled the days, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Joseph and his mother didn't know it, but supposing him to be in the company, they went a day's journey, and they looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem, looking for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the middle of the teacher's, both listening to them and asking them questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, 
your father and I were anxiously looking for you. He said to them, Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? They didn't understand the saying which he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. He was subject to them, and his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Chapter 3 now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate became governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness, he came into all the region around the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley will be filled, every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight, and the rough ways smooth. All flesh will see God's salvation. He said, therefore, to the multitudes who went out to be baptized by him, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, produce fruits worthy of repentance, and don't begin to say among yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I tell you, that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe also lies at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The multitudes asked him, What then must we do? He answered them, He who has two coats, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what must we do? He said to them, Collect no more than that which is appointed to you. Soldiers also asked him, saying, What about us? What must we do? He said to them, Extort from no one by violence neither accuse anyone wrongfully. Be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation, and all men reasoned in their hearts concerning John, whether perhaps he was the Christ, John answered them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but he comes who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to loosen. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor, and will gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then, with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things which Herod had done, added this also to them all, that he shut up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus also had been baptized and was praying. The sky was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form like a dove on him. And a voice came out of the sky, saying, you are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Jesus himself, when he began to teach, was about thirty years old, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Ezlai, 
the son of Nagai, the son of Maath, the son of Mattathias, the son of Simeon, the son of Joseph, the son of Judah, the son of Joanan, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosam, the son of Elmodam, the son of Ur, the son of Josi, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Mattat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonan, the son of Eliakim, the son of Melia, the son of Menan, the son of Mattatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Amenadab, the son of Aram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Seruk, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Chapter 4 Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by the devil. He ate nothing in those days. Afterward, when they were completed, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God. The devil, leading him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I want. If you therefore will worship before me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and you shall serve him only. He led him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, cast yourself down from here, for it is written, He will put his angels in charge of you, to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest perhaps you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus, answering, said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. When the devil had completed every temptation, he departed from him until another time. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit, into Galilee, and news about him spread through all the surrounding area. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. He entered, as was his custom, into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up to read. The book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, 
because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to deliver those who are crushed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began to tell them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All testified about him and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will tell me this parable. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done at Capernaum, do also here in your hometown. He said, Most certainly, I tell you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But truly, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. Elijah was sent to none of them, except to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, except Naaman the Syrian. They were all filled with wrath in the synagogue as they heard these things. They rose up, threw him out of the city, and led him to the brow of the hill that their city was built on that they might throw him off the cliff. But he, passing through the middle of them, went his way. He came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. He was teaching them on the Sabbath day, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. In the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Ah! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down in the middle of them, he came out of him, having done him no harm. Amazement came on all, and they spoke together one with another, saying, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. News about him went out into every place of the surrounding region. He rose up from the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. Simon's mother-in-law was afflicted with a great fever, and they begged him for her. He stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Immediately she rose up and served them. When the sun was setting, all those who had any sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. Rebuking them, he didn't allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. When it was day, he departed and went into an uninhabited place, and the multitudes looked for him and came to him and held on to him, so that he wouldn't go away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of God's kingdom to the other cities also. For this reason I have been sent. He was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. Chapter 5 Now while the multitude pressed on him and heard the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He entered into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. 
When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep, and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered him, Master, we worked all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the net. When they had done this, they caught a great multitude of fish, and their net was breaking. They beckoned to their partners in the other boat that they should come and help them. They came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But Simon Peter, when he saw it, fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, Lord. For he was amazed, and all who were with him, at the catch of fish which they had caught. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will be catching people alive. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man full of leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, saying, Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. He stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I want to be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him. He commanded him to tell no one, but go on your way and show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing according to what Moses commanded for a testimony to them. But the report concerning him spread much more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. But he withdrew himself into the desert and prayed. On one of those days he was teaching, and there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every village of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. The power of the Lord was with him to heal them. Behold, men brought a paralyzed man on a cot, and they sought to bring him in to lay before Jesus. Not finding a way to bring him in because of the multitude, they went up to the housetop and let him down through the tiles with his cot into the middle before Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, answered them, Why are you reasoning so in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, Arise, take up your cot, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, and took up that which he was laying on, and departed to his house, glorifying God. Amazement took hold on all, and they glorified God. They were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office and said to him, Follow me. He left everything and rose up and followed him. Levi made a great feast for him in his house. There was a great crowd of tax collectors and others who were reclining with them. Their scribes and the Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, Those who are healthy have no need for a physician, but those who are sick do. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They said to him, Why do John's disciples often fast and pray, likewise also the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? 
He said to them, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. He also told a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old garment, or else he will tear the new, and also the piece from the new will not match the old. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. No man, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says, The old is better. Chapter 6 Now on the second Sabbath after the first, he was going through the grain fields. His disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said to them, Why do you do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? Jesus, answering them, said, Haven't you read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered into God's house, and took and ate the showbread, and gave also to those who were with him, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests alone? He said to them, This Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. It also happened on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. There was a man there, and his right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, Rise up and stand in the middle. He arose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you something. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? He looked around at them all and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He did, and his hand was restored as sound as the other. But they were filled with rage and talked with one another about what they might do to Jesus. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. When it was day, he called his disciples, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples, and a great number of the people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were troubled by unclean spirits, and they were being healed. All the multitude sought to touch him, for power came out of him and healed them all. He lifted up his eyes to his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor. God's kingdom is yours. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude and mock you, and throw out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for their fathers did the same thing to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you, you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, 
for you will mourn and weep. Woe when men speak well of you, for their fathers did the same thing to the false prophets. But I tell you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. To him who strikes you on the cheek, offer also the other. And from him who takes away your cloak, don't withhold your coat also. Give to everyone who asks you, and don't ask him who takes away your goods to give them back again. As you would like people to do to you, do exactly so to them. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive back as much. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, expecting nothing back, and your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind toward the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, even as your Father is also merciful. Don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. Set free, and you will be set free. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be given to you. For with the same measure you measure, it will be measured back to you. He spoke a parable to them. Can the blind guide the blind? Won't they both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck of chaff that is in your brother's eye, but don't consider the beam that is in your own eye? Or how can you tell your brother, Brother, let me remove the speck of chaff that is in your eye, when you yourself don't see the beam that is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First remove the beam from your own eye, and then you can see clearly to remove the speck of chaff that is in your brother's eye. For there is no good tree that produces rotten fruit, nor again a rotten tree that produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For people don't gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings out that which is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings out that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things which I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you who he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug and went deep and laid a foundation on the rock. When a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it, because it was founded on the rock. But he who hears and doesn't do is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream broke, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Chapter 7 After he had finished speaking in the hearing of the people, he entered into Capernaum. A certain centurion's servant, who was dear to him, was sick and at the point of death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and save his servant. When they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying, he is worthy for you to do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he built our synagogue for us. Jesus went with them. 
when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Therefore I didn't even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having under myself soldiers. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned and said to the multitude who followed him, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, no, not in Israel. Those who were sent, returning to the house, found that the servant who had been sick was well. Soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain. Many of his disciples, along with a great multitude, went with him. Now when he came near to the gate of the city, behold, one who was dead was carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Many people of the city were with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Don't cry. He came near and touched the coffin, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I tell you, arise. He who was dead sat up and began to speak and he gave him to his mother. Fear took hold of all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. This report went out concerning him in the whole of Judea and in all the surrounding region. The disciples of John told him about all these things. John, calling to himself two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the one who is coming, or should we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the baptizer has sent us to you, saying, Are you he who comes, or should we look for another? In that hour he cured many of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and to many who were blind he gave sight. Jesus answered them, Go and tell John the things which you have seen and heard, that the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. Blessed is he who finds no occasion for stumbling in me. When John's messengers had departed, he began to tell the multitudes about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are gorgeously dressed and live delicately are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. For I tell you, among those who are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the baptizer. Yet he who is least in God's kingdom is greater than he. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they declared God to be just, having been baptized with John's baptism. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God, not being baptized by him themselves. To what, then, should I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another, saying, We piped to you, and you didn't dance. We mourned and you didn't weep. For John the baptizer came, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come, eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, 
a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Wisdom is justified by all her children. One of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered into the Pharisee's house and sat at the table. Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that he was reclining in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. Standing behind at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with the hair of her head, kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would have perceived who and what kind of woman this is who touches him, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. He said, Teacher, say on. A certain lender had two debtors. The one owed five hundred denarii and the other fifty. When they couldn't pay, he forgave them both. Which of them, therefore, will love him most? Simon answered, He, I suppose, to whom he forgave the most. He said to him, You have judged correctly. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But one to whom little is forgiven loves little. He said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Chapter 8 Soon afterwards, he went about through cities and villages, preaching and bringing the good news of God's kingdom. With him were the twelve, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Cusas, Herod's steward, Susanna, and many others who served them from their possessions. When a great multitude came together, and people from every city were coming to him, he spoke by parable. The farmer went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some fell along the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the sky devoured it. Other seed fell on the rock, and as soon as it grew, it withered away, because it had no moisture. Other fell amid the thorns, and the thorns grew with it, and choked it. Other fell into the good ground, and grew, and produced one hundred times as much fruit. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples asked him, What does this parable mean? He said, to you it is given to know the mysteries of God's kingdom, but to the rest in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those along the road are those who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart, that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are they who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. But these have no root, who believe for a while, then fall away in time of temptation. 
that which fell among the thorns. These are those who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. Those in the good ground, these are those who, with an honest and good heart, having heard the word, hold it tightly, and produce fruit with perseverance. No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a container, or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand, that those who enter in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be revealed, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Be careful, therefore, how you hear, for whoever has, to him will be given, and whoever doesn't have, from him will be taken away even that which he thinks he has. His mother and brothers came to him, and they could not come near him for the crowd. Some people told him, Your mother and your brothers stand outside, desiring to see you. But he answered them, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Now on one of those days he entered into a boat, himself and his disciples, and he said to them, Let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. A windstorm came down on the lake, and they were taking on dangerous amounts of water. They came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are dying. He awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and it was calm. He said to them, where is your faith? Being afraid, they marveled, saying to one another, Who is this then, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? They arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, a certain man out of the city, who had demons for a long time, met him. He wore no clothes and didn't live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, you son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torment me. For Jesus was commanding the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For the unclean spirit had often seized the man, he was kept under guard and bound with chains and fetters. Breaking the bonds apart, he was driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion. For many demons had entered into him. They begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. Now there was there a herd of many pigs feeding on the mountain and they begged him that he would allow them to enter into those. Then he allowed them. The demons came out of the man and entered into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. People went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who saw it told them how he who had been possessed by demons was healed. All the people of the surrounding country of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were very much afraid. Then he entered into the boat and returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone out begged him that he might go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your house and declare what great things God has done for you. He went his way, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. When Jesus returned, the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Behold, 
a man named Jairus came. He was a ruler of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come into his house, for he had an only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes pressed against him. A woman who had a flow of blood for twelve years, who had spent all her living on physicians and could not be healed by any, came behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. Immediately the flow of her blood stopped. Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes press and jostle you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I perceived that power has gone out of me. When the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came, trembling, and falling down before him, declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. He said to her, Daughter, cheer up, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he still spoke, one from the ruler of the synagogue's house came, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher. But Jesus, hearing it, answered him, Don't be afraid. Only believe, and she will be healed. When he came to the house, he didn't allow anyone to enter in except Peter, John, James, the father of the child, and her mother. All were weeping and mourning her, but he said, Don't weep, she isn't dead, but sleeping. They were ridiculing him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, and taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. Her spirit returned, and she rose up immediately. He commanded that something be given to her to eat. Her parents were amazed, but he commanded them to tell no one what had been done. Chapter 9 He called the twelve together, and gave them power and authority over all demons, and to cure diseases. He sent them out to preach God's kingdom and to heal the sick. He said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staffs, nor wallet, nor bread, nor money. Don't have two coats each. Into whatever house you enter, stay there and depart from there. As many as don't receive you, when you depart from that city, shake off even the dust from your feet for a testimony against them. They departed and went throughout the villages, preaching the good news and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him, and he was very perplexed, because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. Herod said, I beheaded John, but who is this about whom I hear such things? He sought to see him. The apostles, when they had returned, told him what things they had done. He took them and withdrew apart to a desert region of a city called Bethsaida. But the multitudes, perceiving it, followed him. He welcomed them, spoke to them of God's kingdom, and he cured those who needed healing. The day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the surrounding villages and farms and lodge and get food, for we are here in a deserted place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we should go and buy food for all these people. For they were about five thousand men. He said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of about fifty each. They did so, and made them all sit down. He took the five loaves and the two fish, 
and looking up to the sky, he blessed them, broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. They ate and were all filled. They gathered up twelve baskets of broken pieces that were left over. As he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the multitudes say that I am? They answered, John the baptizer, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, The Christ of God. But he warned them and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and the third day be raised up. He said to all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his own self? For whoever will be ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you the truth, there are some of those who stand here who will in no way taste of death until they see God's kingdom. About eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter, John, and James, and went up onto the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became white and dazzling. Behold, two men were talking with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. As they were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he said these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered into the cloud. A voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. When the voice came, Jesus was found alone. They were silent and told no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great multitude met him. Behold, a man from the crowd called out, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. Behold, a spirit takes him. He suddenly cries out, and it convulses him so that he foams, and it hardly departs from him, bruising him severely. I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they couldn't. Jesus answered, Faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him violently. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. They were all astonished at the majesty of God. But while all were marveling at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man will be delivered up into the hands of men. But they didn't understand this saying. It was concealed from them that they should not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. An argument arose among them about which of them was the greatest. Jesus, perceiving the reasoning of their hearts, 
took a little child and set him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For whoever is least among you all, this one will be great. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him, because he doesn't follow with us. Jesus said to him, Don't forbid him, for he who is not against us is for us. It came to pass, when the days were near that he should be taken up, he intently set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face. They went and entered into a village of the Samaritans, so as to prepare for him. They didn't receive him, because he was traveling with his face set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from the sky and destroy them, just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them. You don't know of what kind of spirit you are, for the Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. They went to another village. As they went on the way, a certain man said to him, I want to follow you wherever you go, Lord. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead, but you go and announce God's kingdom. Another also said, I want to follow you, Lord, but first allow me to say goodbye to those who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for God's kingdom. Chapter 10 Now after these things, the Lord also appointed seventy others, and sent them two by two ahead of him, into every city and place where he was about to come. Then he said to them, The harvest is indeed plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore to the Lord of the harvest, that he may send out laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry no purse, nor wallet, nor sandals. Greet no one on the way. Into whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. If a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in that same house, eating and drinking the things they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Don't go from house to house. Into whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat the things that are set before you. Heal the sick who are there, and tell them, God's kingdom has come near to you. But into whatever city you enter, and they don't receive you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust from your city that clings to us we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that God's kingdom has come near to you. I tell you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you! Bethsaida, for if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which were done in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. You, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. And whoever rejects you, rejects me. Whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. 
he said to them, I saw Satan having fallen like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will in any way hurt you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for so it was well-pleasing in your sight. Turning to the disciples, he said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and he to whomever the Son desires to reveal him. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see the things which you see, and didn't see them, and to hear the things which you hear, and didn't hear them. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who both stripped him and beat him, and departed, leaving him half dead. By chance, a certain priest was going down that way. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he traveled, came where he was. When he saw him, he was moved with compassion, came to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the host, and said to him, Take care of him. Whatever you spend beyond that, I will repay you when I return. Now which of these three do you think seemed to be a neighbor to him who fell among the robbers? He said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. As they went on their way, he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she came up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me to serve alone? Ask her, therefore, to help me. Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. Chapter 11 When he finished praying in a certain place, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, 
Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He said to them, Which of you, if you go to a friend at midnight and tell him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within will answer and say, Don't bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give it to you. I tell you, although he will not rise and give it to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as many as he needs. I tell you, keep asking, and it will be given you. Keep seeking, and you will find. Keep knocking, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks it will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he won't give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he won't give him a scorpion, will he? If you, then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He was casting out a demon, and it was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. Others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. A house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. But if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if I, by God's finger, cast out demons, then God's kingdom has come to you. When the strong man, fully armed, guards his own dwelling, his goods are safe. But when someone stronger attacks him and overcomes him, he takes from him his whole armor in which he trusted and divides his plunder. He that is not with me is against me. He who doesn't gather with me scatters. The unclean spirit, when he has gone out of the man, passes through dry places, seeking rest, and finding none, he says, I will turn back to my house from which I came out. When he returns, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes seven other spirits more evil than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. The last state of that man becomes worse than the first. It came to pass, as he said these things, a certain woman out of the multitude lifted up her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. But he said, On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. When the multitudes were gathering together to him, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks after a sign. No sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For even as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so the Son of Man will also be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and will condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, one greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh, will stand up in the judgment with this generation and will condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, 
and behold, one greater than Jonah is here. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when it is evil, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, see whether the light that is in you isn't darkness. If, therefore, your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly full of light, as when the lamp with its bright shining gives you light. Now, as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. He went in and sat at the table. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed himself before dinner. The Lord said to him, now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but your inward part is full of extortion and wickedness. You foolish ones, didn't he who made the outside make the inside also? But give for gifts to the needy those things which are within, and behold, all things will be clean to you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb, but you bypass justice and God's love. You ought to have done these and not to have left the other undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like hidden graves and the men who walk over them don't know it. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying this, you insult us also. He said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load men with burdens which are difficult to carry, and you yourselves won't even lift one finger to help carry those burdens. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them so you testify and consent to the works of your fathers. For they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you took away the key of knowledge. You didn't enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in, you hindered. As he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be terribly angry and to draw many things out of him, lying in wait for him, and seeking to catch him in something he might say, that they might accuse him. Chapter 12 Meanwhile, when a multitude of many thousands had gathered together, so much so that they trampled on each other, he began to tell his disciples, first of all, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the darkness will be heard in the light. What you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. I tell you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who killed the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into Gehenna. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Aren't five sparrows sold for two Asaria coins? Not one of them is forgotten by God. But the very hairs of your head are all counted. Therefore, don't be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. 
I tell you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me in the presence of men will be denied in the presence of God's angels. Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but those who blaspheme against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers, and the authorities, don't be anxious how or what you will answer or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that same hour what you must say. One of the multitude said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? He said to them, Beware, keep yourselves from covetousness, for a man's life doesn't consist of the abundance of the things which he possesses. He spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man produced abundantly. He reasoned within himself, saying, What will I do? because I don't have room to store my crops. He said, This is what I will do. I will pull down my barns, build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. I will tell my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You foolish one, Tonight your soul is required of you. The things which you have prepared, whose will they be? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, don't be anxious for your life, what you will eat, nor yet for your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow. They don't reap. They have no warehouse or barn, and God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? Which of you, by being anxious, can add a cubit to his height? If then you aren't able to do even the least things, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They don't toil neither do they spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if this is how God clothes the grass in the field, which today exists and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Don't seek what you will eat or what you will drink, neither be anxious. For the nations of the world seek after all of these things, but your Father knows that you need these things. But seek God's kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. Don't be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that which you have, and give gifts to the needy. Make for yourselves purses which don't grow old, a treasure in the heavens that doesn't fail, where no thief approaches, neither moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your waist be dressed and your lamps burning. Be like men watching for their Lord when he returns from the wedding feast, that when he comes and knocks, they may immediately open to him. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord will find watching when he comes. Most certainly, I tell you, that he will dress himself, make them recline, and will come and serve them. They will be blessed if he comes in the second or third watch and finds them so. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what hour the thief was coming, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, be ready also, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you don't expect him. Peter said to him, Lord, 
Are you telling this parable to us or to everybody? The Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord will set over his household, to give them their portion of food at the right times? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord will find doing so when he comes. Truly I tell you, that he will set him over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, and begins to beat the men servants and the maid servants, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, then the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he isn't expecting him, and in an hour that he doesn't know, and will cut him in two, and place his portion with the unfaithful. That servant, who knew his Lord's will, and didn't prepare, nor do what he wanted, will be beaten with many stripes. But he who didn't know, and did things worthy of stripes, will be beaten with few stripes. To whomever much is given, of him will much be required. And to whom much was entrusted, of him more will be asked. I came to throw fire on the earth, I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace in the earth? I tell you, no, but rather division. For from now on, there will be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against her mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He said to the multitudes also, When you see a cloud rising from the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming, and so it happens. When a south wind blows, you say, There will be a scorching heat and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but how is it that you don't interpret this time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? For when you are going with your adversary before the magistrate, try diligently on the way to be released from him, lest perhaps he drag you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the very last penny. Chapter 13 Now there were some present at the same time who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all perish in the same way. Or those eighteen, on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the men who dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all perish in the same way. He spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came, seeking fruit on it, and found none. He said to the vine dresser, Behold, these three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and found none. Cut it down. Why does it waste the soil? He answered, Lord, Leave it alone this year also, until I dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit, fine, but if not, after that you can cut it down. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity eighteen years. She was bent over and could in no way straighten herself up. When Jesus saw her, he called her and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your infirmity. He laid his hands on her, and immediately she stood up straight and glorified God. 
the ruler of the synagogue, being indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the multitude, There are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore, come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Therefore the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each one of you free his ox or his donkey from the stall on the Sabbath and lead him away to water? Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound eighteen long years, be freed from this bondage on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were disappointed, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. He said, what is God's kingdom like? To what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and put in his own garden. It grew and became a large tree, and the birds of the sky live in its branches. Again he said, To what shall I compare God's kingdom? It is like yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour, until it was all leavened. He went on his way through cities and villages, teaching and traveling on to Jerusalem. One said to him, Lord, are they few who are saved? He said to them, Strive to enter in by the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter in and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer and tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. He will say, I tell you, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in God's kingdom, and yourselves being thrown outside. They will come from the east, west, north, and south, and will sit down in God's kingdom. Behold, there are some who are last who will be first, and there are some who are first who will be last. On that same day, some Pharisees came, saying to him, Get out of here and go away, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I complete my mission. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the next day, for it can't be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, like a hen gathers her own brood under her wings, and you refused. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Chapter 14 when he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees on a Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him. Behold, a certain man who had dropsy was in front of him. Jesus, answering, spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they were silent. He took him and healed him and let him go. He answered them, which of you, if your son or an ox fell into a well, wouldn't immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? They couldn't answer him regarding these things. He spoke a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the best seats and said to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, don't sit in the best seat since perhaps someone more honorable than you might be invited by him, and he who invited both of you would come and tell you, Make room for this person. 
Then you would begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may tell you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, When you make a dinner or a supper, don't call your friends, nor your brothers, nor your kinsmen, nor rich neighbors, or perhaps they might also return the favor and pay you back. But when you make a feast, ask the poor, the maimed, the lame, or the blind, and you will be blessed, because they don't have the resources to repay you. For you will be repaid in the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who will feast in God's kingdom. But he said to him, A certain man made a great supper, and he invited many people. He sent out his servant at supper time to tell those who were invited, Come, for everything is ready now. They all, as one, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I must go try them out. Please have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I can't come. That servant came, and told his lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor, maimed, blind, and lame. The servant said, Lord, it is done as you commanded, and there is still room. The lord said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you that none of those men who were invited will taste of my supper. Now great multitudes were going with him. He turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and doesn't disregard his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he can't be my disciple. Whoever doesn't bear his own cross and come after me can't be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and count the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Or perhaps, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, everyone who sees begins to mock him, saying, This man began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king? as he goes to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an envoy and asks for conditions of peace. So therefore, whoever of you who doesn't renounce all that he has, he can't be my disciple. Salt is good. But if the salt becomes flat and tasteless, with what do you season it? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Chapter 15 Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming close to him to hear him. The Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. He told them this parable, Which of you men, if you had one hundred sheep and lost one of them, wouldn't leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that was lost until he found it? When he has found it, he carries it on his shoulders, rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. 
I tell you that even so, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. Or what woman, if she had ten drachma coins, if she lost one drachma coin, wouldn't light a lamp, sweep the house, and seek diligently until she found it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the drachma which I had lost. Even so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner repenting. He said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of your property. He divided his livelihood between them. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all of this together and traveled into a far country. There he wasted his property with riotous living. When he had spent all of it, there arose a severe famine in that country, and he began to be in need. He went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He wanted to fill his belly with the husks that the pigs ate, but no one gave him any. But when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I am dying with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and will tell him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. He arose and came to his father, but while he was still far off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let's eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Then they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. As he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants to him and asked what was going on. He said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back, safe and healthy. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and begged him. But he answered his father, Behold, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed a commandment of yours. But you never gave me a goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this your son came, who has devoured your living with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. He said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But it was appropriate to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Chapter 16 He also said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a manager. An accusation was made to him that this man was wasting his possessions. He called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager. The manager said within himself, What will I do? seeing that my Lord is taking away the management position from me. I don't have strength to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I know what I will do, so that when I am removed from management, they may receive me into their houses. Calling each one of his Lord's debtors to him, he said to the first, How much do you owe to my Lord? He said, A hundred battles of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, 
How much do you owe? He said, A hundred cores of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. His Lord commended the dishonest manager because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are, in their own generation, wiser than the children of the light. I tell you, make for yourselves friends by means of unrighteous mammon, so that when you fail, they may receive you into the eternal tents. He who is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. He who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If, therefore, you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You aren't able to serve God and mammon. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they scoffed at him. He said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. From that time the good news of God's kingdom is preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tiny stroke of a pen in the law to fall. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. He who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. Now there was a certain rich man, and he was clothed in purple and fine linen, living in luxury every day. A certain beggar named Lazarus was taken to his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Yes, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The beggar died, and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus at his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in the same way bad things. But here he is now comforted, and you are in anguish. Besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, that those who want to pass from here to you are not able, and that no one may cross over from there to us. He said, I ask you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, so they won't also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if one rises from the dead. Chapter 17 He said to the disciples, It is impossible that no occasions of stumbling should come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, rather than that he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be careful. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in the day and seven times returns, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. 
The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord said, If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you would tell this sycamore tree, Be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. But who is there among you, having a servant plowing or keeping sheep, that will say when he comes in from the field, Come immediately and sit down at the table, and will not rather tell him, Prepare my supper, clothe yourself properly, and serve me while I eat and drink. Afterward you shall eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded? I think not. Even so you also, when you have done all the things that are commanded you, say, We are unworthy servants. We have done our duty. As he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing along the borders of Samaria and Galilee. As he entered into a certain village, ten men who were lepers met him, who stood at a distance. They lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus answered, Weren't the ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there none found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go your way. Your faith has healed you. Being asked by the Pharisees when God's kingdom would come, he answered them, God's kingdom doesn't come with observation. Neither will they say, Look here or look there. For behold, God's kingdom is within you. He said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will tell you, Look here, or look there. Don't go away or follow after them. For as the lightning, when it flashes out of one part under the sky, shines to another part under the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things, and be rejected by this generation. As it was in the days of Noah, even so will it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ship, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, even as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But in the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from the sky and destroyed them all. It will be the same way in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who will be on the housetop and his goods in the house, let him not go down to take them away. Let him who is in the field likewise not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life loses it, but whoever loses his life preserves it. I tell you, in that night there will be two people in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other will be left. They, answering, asked him, Where, Lord? He said to them, where the body is, there the vultures will also be gathered together. Chapter 18 He also spoke a parable to them that they must always pray and not give up, saying, There was a judge in a certain city who didn't fear God and didn't respect man. A widow was in that city, and she often came to him, saying, Defend me from my adversary. He wouldn't for a while. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will defend her, 
or else she will wear me out by her continual coming. The Lord said, Listen to what the unrighteous judge says. Won't God avenge his chosen ones who are crying out to him day and night, and yet he exercises patience with them? I tell you that he will avenge them quickly. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He spoke also this parable to certain people who were convinced of their own righteousness and who despised all others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed to himself like this, God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men, extortionists, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far away, wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but he who humbles himself will be exalted. They were also bringing their babies to him, that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. Jesus summoned them, saying, Allow the little children to come to me, and don't hinder them, for God's kingdom belongs to such as these. Most certainly, I tell you, Whoever doesn't receive God's kingdom like a little child, he will in no way enter into it. A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asked him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. He said, I have observed all these things from my youth up. When Jesus heard these things, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was very rich. Jesus, seeing that he became very sad, said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter into God's kingdom, for it is easier for a camel to enter in through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into God's kingdom. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Peter said, Look, we have left everything and followed you. He said to them, Most certainly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for God's kingdom's sake who will not receive many times more in this time and in the world to come eternal life. He took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all the things that are written through the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be completed, for he will be delivered up to the Gentiles, will be mocked, treated shamefully, and spit on. They will scourge and kill him. On the third day he will rise again, they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they didn't understand the things that were said. As he came near Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the road, begging. Hearing a multitude going by, he asked what this meant. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. He cried out, Jesus, you son of David! Have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him that he should be quiet. 
But he cried out all the more, You son of David, have mercy on me. Standing still, Jesus commanded him to be brought to him. When he had come near, he asked him, What do you want me to do? He said, Lord, that I may see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. All the people, when they saw it, praised God. Chapter 19 He entered and was passing through Jericho. There was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was and couldn't because of the crowd, because he was short. He ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. He hurried came down and received him joyfully. When they saw it, they all murmured, saying, He has gone in to lodge with a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. If I have wrongfully exacted anything of anyone, I restore four times as much. Jesus said to him, Today, Salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. As they heard these things, he went on and told a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that God's kingdom would be revealed immediately. He said, therefore, A certain nobleman went into a far country, to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. He called ten servants of his and gave them ten minor coins and told them, Conduct business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent an envoy after him, saying, We don't want this man to reign over us. When he had come back again, having received the kingdom, he commanded these servants, to whom he had given the money, to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by conducting business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten more minas. He said to him, Well done, you good servant, because you were found faithful with very little. You shall have authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, your mina, Lord, has made five minas. So he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Another came, saying, Lord, behold your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I feared you, because you are an exacting man. You take up that which you didn't lay down, and reap that which you didn't sow. He said to him, out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I am an exacting man, taking up that which I didn't lay down, and reaping that which I didn't sow. Then why didn't you deposit my money in the bank, and at my coming I might have earned interest on it? He said to those who stood by, Take the miner away from him, and give it to him who has the ten minas. They said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. For I tell you that to everyone who has will more be given. But from him who doesn't have, even that which he has will be taken away from him. But bring those enemies of mine who didn't want me to reign over them here and kill them before me. Having said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he came near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, 
Go your way into the village on the other side, in which, as you enter, you will find a colt tied, which no man had ever sat upon. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say to him, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent went away and found things just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners said to him, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt and set Jesus on them. As he went, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was now getting near, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees from the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered them, I tell you that if these were silent, the stones would cry out. When he came near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had known today the things which belong to your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come on you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you, surround you, hem you in on every side, and will dash you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone on another, because you didn't know the time of your visitation. He entered into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. He was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leading men among the people sought to destroy him. They couldn't find what they might do, for all the people hung on to every word that he said. Chapter 20 on one of those days, as he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the good news, the priests and scribes came to him with the elders. They asked him, Tell us, by what authority do you do these things, or who is giving you this authority? He answered them, I also will ask you one question. Tell me, the baptism of John, was it from heaven? or from men. They reasoned with themselves, saying, If we say, From heaven, he will say, Why didn't you believe him? But if we say, From men, all the people will stone us, for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. They answered that they didn't know where it was from. Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to some farmers and went into another country for a long time. At the proper season, he sent a servant to the farmers to collect his share of the fruit of the vineyard. But the farmers beat him and sent him away empty. He sent yet another servant, and they also beat him and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty. He sent yet a third, and they also wounded him and threw him out. The Lord of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be that seeing him, they will respect him. But when the farmers saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him that the inheritance may be ours. They threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What, therefore, will the Lord of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy these farmers and will give the vineyard to others. When they heard that, they said, May that never be! But he looked at them and said, 
Then what is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected was made the chief cornerstone? Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but it will crush whomever it falls on to dust. The chief priests and the scribes sought to lay hands on him that very hour, but they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. They watched him and sent out spies who pretended to be righteous that they might trap him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the power and authority of the governor. They asked him, Teacher, we know that you say and teach what is right and aren't partial to anyone, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Why do you test me? Show me a denarius, whose image and inscription are on it. They answered, Caesar's. He said to them, Then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. They weren't able to trap him in his words before the people. They marveled at his answer and were silent. Some of the Sadducees came to him, those who deny that there is a resurrection. They asked him, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies having a wife, and he is childless, his brother should take the wife and raise up children for his brother. There were, therefore, seven brothers. The first took a wife and died childless. The second took her as wife, and he died childless. The third took her, and likewise the seven, all left no children, and died. Afterward, the woman also died. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of them will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. Jesus said to them, The children of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they can't die any more, for they are like the angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all are alive to him. Some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you speak well. They didn't dare to ask him any more questions. He said to them, Why do they say that the Christ is David's son? David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool of your feet. David therefore calls him Lord, so how is he his son? In the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of those scribes who like to walk in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Chapter 21 He looked up and saw the rich people who were putting their gifts into the treasury. He saw a certain poor widow casting in two small brass coins. He said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For all these put in gifts for God from their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. As some were talking about the temple and how it was decorated with beautiful stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which you see, the days will come in which there will not be left here one stone on another that will not be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, so when will these things be? What is the sign that these things are about to happen? 
He said, Watch out that you don't get led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Therefore, don't follow them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, don't be terrified, for these things must happen first, but the end won't come immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and plagues in various places. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will turn out as a testimony for you. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to withstand or to contradict. You will be handed over even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends. They will cause some of you to be put to death. You will be hated by all men for my name's sake, and not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will win your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is at hand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the middle of her depart. Let those who are in the country not enter therein. For these are days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who nurse infants in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath to this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on the earth anxiety of nations, in perplexity for the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting for fear and for expectation of the things which are coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is near. He told them a parable. See the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see it and know by your own selves that the summer is already near. Even so, you also, when you see these things happening, know that God's kingdom is near. Most certainly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things are accomplished. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So be careful, or your hearts will be loaded down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day will come on you suddenly, for it will come like a snare on all those who dwell on the surface of all the earth, Therefore, be watchful all the time, praying that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will happen, and to stand before the Son of Man. Every day Jesus was teaching in the temple, and every night he would go out and spend the night on the mountain that is called Olivet. All the people came early in the morning to him in the temple to hear him. Chapter 22 Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. The chief priests and the scribes sought how they might put him to death, for they feared the people. Satan entered into Judas, who was also called Iscariot, who was counted with the twelve. He went away and talked with the chief priests and captains, about how he might deliver him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. He consented and sought an opportunity to deliver him to them in the absence of the multitude. 
the day of unleavened bread came, on which the Passover must be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him into the house which he enters. Tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large furnished upper room. Make preparations there. They went, found things as Jesus had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will no longer by any means eat of it until it is fulfilled in God's kingdom. He received a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, I will not drink at all again from the fruit of the vine until God's kingdom comes. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. Likewise he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. The Son of Man indeed goes, as it has been determined. But woe to that man through whom he is betrayed. They began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. A dispute also arose among them which of them was considered to be greatest. He said to them, The kings of the nations lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you, but one who is the greater among you. Let him become as the younger, and one who is governing as one who serves. For who is greater, one who sits at the table or one who serves? Isn't it he who sits at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. I confer on you a kingdom, even as my Father conferred on me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. You will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan asked to have all of you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. You, when once you have turned again, establish your brothers. He said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. He said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will by no means crow today until you deny that you know me three times. He said to them, When I send you out without purse, wallet, and sandals, did you lack anything? They said, Nothing. Then he said to them, But now, whoever has a purse, let him take it, and likewise a wallet. Whoever has none, let him sell his cloak and buy a sword. For I tell you that this which is written must still be fulfilled in me. He was counted with transgressors, for that which concerns me has an end. They said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. He said to them, That is enough. He came out and went, as his custom was, to the Mount of Olives. His disciples also followed him. When he was at the place, he said to them, Pray that you don't enter into temptation. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he rose up from his prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief and said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He came near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was about to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? A certain one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered, Let me at least do this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and elders who had come against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you in the temple daily, you didn't stretch out your hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. They seized him and led him away and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed from a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat among them. A certain servant girl saw him as he sat in the light and looking intently at him, said, This man also was with him. He denied Jesus, saying, Woman, I don't know him. After a little while, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter answered, Man, I am not. After about one hour passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Truly, this man also was with him for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the Lord's word, how he said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and wept bitterly. The men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. Having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, Prophesy! Who is the one who struck you? They spoke many other things against him, insulting him. As soon as it was day, the assembly of the elders of the people were gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away into their council, saying, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you won't believe. And if I ask, you will in no way answer me or let me go. From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. They all said, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You say it because I am. They said, why do we need any more witness? For we ourselves have heard from his own mouth. Chapter 23 The whole company of them rose up and brought him before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting the nation, forbidding paying taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, So you say. Pilate said to the chief priests and the multitudes, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, even to this place. But when Pilate heard Galilee mentioned, 
he asked if the man was Galilean. When he found out that he was in Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem during those days. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had wanted to see him for a long time, because he had heard many things about him. He hoped to see some miracle done by him. He questioned him with many words, but he gave no answers. The chief priests and the scribes stood, vehemently accusing him. Herod, with his soldiers, humiliated him and mocked him. Dressing him in luxurious clothing, they sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before that they were enemies with each other. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought this man to me as one that perverts the people. And behold, having examined him before you, I found no basis for a charge against this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. Neither has Herod, for I sent you to him, and see, nothing worthy of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. Now he had to release one prisoner to them at the feast. But they all cried out together, saying, Away with this man! Release to us Barabbas! One who was thrown into prison for a certain revolt in the city and for murder. Then Pilate spoke to them again, wanting to release Jesus. But they shouted, saying, Crucify! Crucify! Crucify him! Crucify him! He said to them the third time, Why? What evil has this man done? I have found no capital crime in him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. But they were urgent with loud voices, asking that he might be crucified. Their voices and the voices of the chief priests prevailed. Pilate decreed that what they asked for should be done. He released him who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus up to their will. When they led him away, they grabbed one Simon of Cyrene, coming from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it after Jesus. A great multitude of the people followed him, including women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to tell the mountains, Fall on us, and tell the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what will be done in the dry? There were also others, two criminals, led with him to be put to death. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified him there with the criminals, one on the right, and the other on the left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Dividing his garments among them, they cast lots. The people stood watching. The rulers with them also scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was also written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanged insulted him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, and rebuking him, said, Don't you even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? 
and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong, he said to Jesus. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus said to him. Assuredly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. The sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. All the multitudes that came together to see this, when they saw the things that were done, returned home, beating their breasts. All his acquaintances and the women who followed with him from Galilee stood at a distance, watching these things. Behold, a man named Joseph, who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. He had not consented to their counsel and deed. From Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who was also waiting for God's kingdom, this man went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. He took it down and wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid him in a tomb that was cut in stone, where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of the preparation, and the Sabbath was drawing near. The women who had come with him out of Galilee followed after, and saw the tomb, and how his body was laid. They returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day they rested according to the commandment. Chapter 24 But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they and some others came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They entered in and didn't find the Lord Jesus' body. While they were greatly perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling clothing. Becoming terrified, they bowed their faces down to the earth. They said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He isn't here, but is risen. Remember what he told you when he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered up into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again? They remembered his words, returned from the tomb, and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James. The other women with them told these things to the apostles. These words seemed to them to be nonsense, and they didn't believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he departed to his home, wondering what had happened. Behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was sixty stadia from Jerusalem. They talked with each other about all of these things which had happened. While they talked and questioned together, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, What are you talking about as you walk and are sad? One of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things which have happened there in these days? He said to them, What things? They said to him, The things concerning Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. 
but we were hoping that it was he who would redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Also, certain women of our company amazed us, having arrived early at the tomb. And when they didn't find his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. Some of us went to the tomb and found it just like the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, Foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Christ have to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Beginning from Moses and from all the prophets, he explained to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They came near to the village where they were going, and he acted like he would go further. They urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is almost evening, and the day is almost over. He went in to stay with them. When he had sat down at the table with them, he took the bread and gave thanks. Breaking it, he gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Then he vanished out of their sight. They said to one another, Weren't our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us along the way and while he opened the scriptures to us? They rose up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. They related the things that happened along the way and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. As they said these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were terrified and filled with fear and supposed that they had seen a spirit. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is truly me. Touch me and see for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still didn't believe for joy and wondered, he said to them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. He took them and ate in front of them. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you that all things which are written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds, that they might understand the scriptures. He said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send out the promise of my Father on you, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. He led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he blessed them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. They worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. John Chapter 1 In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness hasn't overcome it. There came a man, sent from God, whose name was John. The same came as a witness, that he might testify about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but was sent that he might testify about the light. The true light that enlightens everyone 
was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own, and those who were his own didn't receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become God's children. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and lived among us. We saw his glory, such glory as of the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him. He cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, for he was before me. From his fullness we all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the one and only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. This is John's testimony when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He declared, and didn't deny, but he declared, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. They said therefore to him, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. The ones who had been sent were from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then do you baptize, if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you don't know. He is the one who comes after me, who is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loosen. These things were done in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I didn't know him, but for this reason I came baptizing in water, that he would be revealed to Israel. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending like a dove out of heaven, and it remained on him. I didn't recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, On whomever you will see the Spirit descending and remaining on him is he who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Again the next day. John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is, being interpreted, Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is, by interpretation, Peter. On the next day, he was determined to go out into Galilee, and he found Philip. Jesus said to him, Follow me.
Now Philip was from Bethsaida, of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said about him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I told you I saw you underneath the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. He said to him, Most certainly I tell you all, hereafter you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Chapter 2 The third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus also was invited with his disciples to the wedding. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six water pots of stone set there after the Jews' way of purifying, containing two or three metrics apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the ruler of the feast. So they took it. When the ruler of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and didn't know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the ruler of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the guests have drunk freely, then that which is worse. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who sold oxen, sheep and doves, and the changers of money, sitting. He made a whip of cords, and threw all out of the temple, both the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the changers' money, and overthrew their tables. To those who sold the doves, he said, Take these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will eat me up. The Jews therefore answered him, What sign do you show us, seeing that you do these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews therefore said, It took forty-six years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he did. But Jesus didn't entrust himself to them, because he knew everyone and because he didn't need for anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Chapter 3 Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, 
a ruler of the Jews. The same came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Most certainly, I tell you, unless one is born anew, he can't see God's kingdom. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most certainly, I tell you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he can't enter into God's kingdom. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. The wind blows where it wants to, and you hear its sound, but don't know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel and don't understand these things? Most certainly I tell you, we speak that which we know and testify of that which we have seen, and you don't receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven but he who descended out of heaven, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God didn't send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who doesn't believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their works were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and doesn't come to the light, lest his works would be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his works may be revealed, that they have been done in God. After these things, Jesus came with his disciples into the land of Judea. He stayed there with them and baptized. John also was baptizing in Enon near Salem, because there was much water there. They came and were baptized, for John was not yet thrown into prison. Therefore a dispute arose on the part of John's disciples with some Jews about purification. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, Behold, he baptizes, and everyone is coming to him. John answered, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies, and no one receives his witness. He who has received his witness has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. 
one who believes in the son has eternal life but one who disobeys the son won't see life but the wrath of god remains on him chapter four therefore when the lord knew that the pharisees had heard that jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than john although jesus himself didn't baptize but his disciples he left judea and departed into galilee he needed to pass through samaria so he came to a city of samaria called sychar near the parcel of ground that jacob gave to his son joseph jacob's well was there jesus therefore being tired from his journey sat down by the well it was about the sixth hour a woman of samaria came to draw water jesus said to her give me a drink for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food the samaritan woman therefore said to him how is it that you being a jew ask for a drink from me a samaritan woman for jews have no dealings with samaritans jesus answered her if you knew the gift of god and who it is who says to you give me a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water the woman said to him sir you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep so where do you get that living water are you greater than our father jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his children and his livestock jesus answered her everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again but whoever drinks of the water that i will give him will never thirst again but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty, neither come all the way here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You said well i have no husband for you have had five husbands and he whom you now have is not your husband this you have said truly the woman said to him sir i perceive that you are a prophet our fathers worshipped in this mountain and you jews say that in jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship jesus said to her woman believe me the hour comes when neither in this mountain nor in jerusalem will you worship the father you worship that which you don't know we worship that which we know for salvation is from the jews but the hour comes and now is when the true worshippers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father seeks such to be his worshippers god is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth the woman said to him i know that messiah comes he who is called christ when he has come he will declare to us all things jesus said to her i am he the one who speaks to you at this his disciples came they marveled that he was speaking with a woman yet no one said what are you looking for or why do you speak with her so the woman left her water pot went away into the city and said to the people come see a man who told me everything that i did can this be the christ they went out of the city and were coming to him in the meanwhile the disciples urged him saying rabbi eat but he said to them i have food to eat that you don't know about the disciples therefore said to one another has anyone brought him something to eat jesus said to them my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work don't you say there are yet four months until the harvest 
Behold, I tell you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, that they are white for harvest already. He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit to eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that for which you haven't labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman, who testified, He told me everything that I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they begged him to stay with them. He stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of your speaking, for we have heard for ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. After the two days, he went out from there and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came into Galilee, the Galileans received him having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast. For they also went to the feast. Jesus came, therefore, again to Cana of Galilee, where he made the water into wine. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and begged him that he would come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. Jesus, therefore, said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will in no way believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. As he was now going down, his servants met him and reported, saying, Your child lives! So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. They said, therefore, to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. He believed, as did his whole house. This is again the second sign that Jesus did, having come out of Judea into Galilee. Chapter 5 After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, there is a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, or paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at certain times into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. A certain man was there who had been sick for thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had been sick for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Arise, take up your mat and walk. Immediately the man was made well, and took up his mat and walked. Now it was the Sabbath on that day, so the Jews said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry the mat. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your mat and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your mat and walk? But he who was healed didn't know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a crowd being in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, 
you are made well. Sin no more, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this cause, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he did these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, so I am working too. For this cause, therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Jesus, therefore, answered them, Most certainly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father doing. For whatever things he does, these the Son also does likewise. For the Father has affection for the Son, and shows him all things that he himself does. He will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he desires. For the Father judges no one, but he has given all judgment to the Son that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who doesn't honor the Son doesn't honor the Father who sent him. Most certainly I tell you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and doesn't come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Most certainly I tell you, the hour comes and now is when the dead will hear the Son of God's voice, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. He also gave him authority to execute judgment, because he is a Son of Man. Don't marvel at this, for the hour comes in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I don't seek my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. If I testify about myself, my witness is not valid. It is another who testifies about me, I know that the testimony which he testifies about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man. However, I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than that of John. For the works which the Father gave me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me, that the Father has sent me. The Father himself, who sent me, has testified about me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. You don't have his word living in you, because you don't believe him whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and these are they which testify about me. Yet you will not come to me that you may have life. I don't receive glory from men, but I know you that you don't have God's love in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe? You receive glory from one another, and you don't seek the glory that comes from the only God. Don't think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, even Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Chapter 6 After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is also called 
the sea of Tiberias. A great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs which he did on those who were sick. Jesus went up into the mountain, and he sat there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Jesus, therefore, lifting up his eyes, and seeing that a great multitude was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread, that these may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down, in number about five thousand. Jesus took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to those who were sitting down, likewise also of the fish, as much as they desired. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the broken pieces which are left over, that nothing be lost. So they gathered them up, and filled twelve baskets with broken pieces from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. When, therefore, the people saw the sign which Jesus did, they said, This is truly the prophet who comes into the world. Jesus, therefore, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They entered into the boat and were going over the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not come to them. The sea was tossed by a great wind blowing. When, therefore, they had rowed about twenty-five or thirty stadia, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. They were willing, therefore, to receive him into the boat. Immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. On the next day the multitude that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except the one in which his disciples had embarked and that Jesus hadn't entered with his disciples into the boat. But his disciples had gone away alone. However, boats from Tiberias came near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the multitude, therefore, saw that Jesus wasn't there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Most certainly I tell you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food which perishes, but for the food which remains to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For God the Father has sealed him. They said therefore to him, What must we do, that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. They said, therefore, to him, What then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus, therefore, said to them, Most certainly, I tell you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread out of heaven, but my father gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. They said therefore to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will not be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I told you that you have seen me, and yet you don't believe. All those whom the Father gives me will come to me. He who comes to me I will in no way throw out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of my Father who sent me, that of all he has given to me, I should lose nothing, but should raise him up at the last day. This is the will of the one who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews therefore murmured concerning him, because he said, I am the bread which came down out of heaven. They said, Isn't this Jesus? the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How then does he say, I have come down out of heaven? Therefore Jesus answered them, Don't murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, They will all be taught by God. Therefore, Everyone who hears from the Father and has learned comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most certainly, I tell you, he who believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Yes, the bread which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews therefore contended with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus therefore said to them, Most certainly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you don't have life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as our fathers ate the manna and died, he who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at this, said to them, Does this cause you to stumble? Then what if you would see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and are life but there are some of you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who didn't believe, and who it was who would betray him. He said, For this cause I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it is given to him by my Father. At this, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Jesus said, therefore, to the twelve, you don't also want to go away, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Didn't I choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? Now he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot for it was he who would betray him.
being one of the twelve. Chapter 7 After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he wouldn't walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see your works which you do. For no one does anything in secret while he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, reveal yourself to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. Jesus therefore said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world can't hate you but it hates me, because I testify about it, that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, because my time is not yet fulfilled. Having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but as it were in secret. The Jews therefore sought him at the feast, and said, Where is he? There was much murmuring among the multitudes concerning him. Some said, He is a good man. Others said, Not so, but he leads the multitude astray. Yet no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. But when it was now the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple, and taught. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never been educated? Jesus therefore answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone desires to do his will, he will know about the teaching, whether it is from God, or if I am speaking from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Didn't Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The multitude answered, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel because of it. Moses has given you circumcision, not that it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And on the Sabbath you circumcise a boy. If a boy receives circumcision on the Sabbath, that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely healthy on the Sabbath? Don't judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Therefore some of them of Jerusalem said, isn't this he whom they seek to kill? Behold, he speaks openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the rulers indeed know this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man comes from. But when the Christ comes, no one will know where he comes from. Jesus, therefore, cried out in the temple, teaching and saying, You both know me and know where I am from. I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you don't know. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. They sought, therefore, to take him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. But of the multitude, many believed in him. They said, When the Christ comes, he won't do more signs than those which this man has done, will he? The Pharisees heard the multitude murmuring these things concerning him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Then Jesus said, I will be with you a little while longer. Then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and won't find me. You can't come where I am. The Jews, therefore, said among themselves, Where will this man go that we won't find him? Will he go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is this word that he said? You will seek me and won't find me, and 
where I am you can't come. Now on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from within him will flow rivers of living water. But he said this about the Spirit, which those believing in him were to receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus wasn't yet glorified. Many of the multitude, therefore, when they heard these words, said, This is truly the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, What? Does the Christ come out of Galilee? Hasn't the scripture said that the Christ comes of the offspring of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division arose in the multitude because of him. Some of them would have arrested him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers, therefore, came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why didn't you bring him? The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees therefore answered them, You aren't also led astray, are you? Have any of the rulers believed in him or of the Pharisees? But this multitude that doesn't know the law is cursed. Nicodemus, he who came to him by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man? unless it first hears from him personally and knows what he does? They answered him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and see that no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Everyone went to his own house. Chapter 8 But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now very early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him. He sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman taken in adultery. Having set her in the middle, they told him, Teacher, we found this woman in adultery, in the very act. Now in our law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say about her? They said this, testing him that they might have something to accuse him of. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he looked up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. They, when they heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning from the oldest, even to the last. Jesus was left alone with the woman where she was, in the middle. Jesus, standing up, saw her and said, Woman, where are your accusers? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way. From now on, sin no more. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You testify about yourself. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered them, Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you don't know where I came from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It's also written in your law that the testimony of two people is valid. I am one who testifies about myself and the Father who sent me testifies about me. They said therefore to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. 
Jesus spoke these words in the treasury as he taught in the temple. Yet no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Jesus said therefore again to them, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sins. Where I go, you can't come. The Jews therefore said, Will he kill himself because he says, Where I am going, you can't come? He said to them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. They said therefore to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you. However, he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I say to the world. They didn't understand that he spoke to them about the Father. Jesus, therefore, said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I say these things. He who sent me is with me. The Father hasn't left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he spoke these things, many believed in him. Jesus, therefore, said to those Jews who had believed him, If you remain in my word, then you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's offspring and have never been in bondage to anyone. How do you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most certainly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is the bondservant of sin. A bondservant doesn't live in the house forever. A son remains forever. If, therefore, the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's offspring, yet you seek to kill me, because my word finds no place in you. I say the things which I have seen with my father, and you also do the things which you have seen with your father. They answered him, Our father is Abraham. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. You do the works of your father. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one Father, God. Therefore Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I came out and have come from God. For I haven't come of myself, but he sent me. Why don't you understand my speech? Because you can't hear my word. You are of your Father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your Father. He was a murderer from the beginning and doesn't stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks on his own, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you don't believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God, for this cause you don't hear, because you are not of God. Then the Jews answered him, Don't we say well that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I don't have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. But I don't seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most certainly, I tell you, if a person keeps my word, he will never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. And you say, If a man keeps my word, he will never taste of death? Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? The prophets died. 
who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say that he is our God. You have not known him, but I know him. If I said I don't know him, I would be like you, a liar. But I know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews therefore said to him, You are not yet fifty years old. Have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most certainly I tell you, before Abraham came into existence, I am. Therefore they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple, having gone through the middle of them, and so passed by. Chapter 9 As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, This man didn't sin, nor did his parents, but that the works of God might be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground, made mud with the saliva, anointed the blind man's eyes with the mud, and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went away, washed and came back seeing the neighbors therefore and those who saw that he was blind before said isn't this he who sat and begged others were saying it is he still others were saying he looks like him he said i am he they therefore were asking him how were your eyes opened he answered a man called Jesus made mud, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed, and I received sight. Then they asked him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought him, who had been blind, to the Pharisees. It was a Sabbath when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Again, therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, I washed, and I see. Some, therefore, of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? There was division among them. Therefore they asked the blind man again, What do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews, therefore, didn't believe concerning him, that he had been blind and had received his sight, until they called the parents of him who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, whom you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we don't know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if any man would confess him as Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So they called the man who was blind a second time and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He therefore answered, I don't know if he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, 
and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't also want to become his disciples, do you? They insulted him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered them, How amazing! You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he listens to him. Since the world began, it has never been heard of that anyone opened the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were altogether born in sins, and do you teach us? Then they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who speaks with you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, that those who don't see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remains. Chapter 10 Most certainly I tell you, one who doesn't enter by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, is a thief and a robber. But one who enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Whenever he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. They will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they don't know the voice of strangers. Jesus spoke this parable to them, but they didn't understand what he was telling them. Jesus, therefore, said to them again, Most certainly, I tell you, I am the sheep's door. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters in by me, he will be saved and will go in and go out and will find pasture. The thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who doesn't own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and flees. The wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. The hired hand flees because he is a hired hand and doesn't care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and I'm known by my own, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice. They will become one flock with one shepherd. Therefore the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down by myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. I received this commandment from my father. Therefore a division arose again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others said, These are not the sayings of one possessed by a demon. It isn't possible for a demon to open the eyes of the blind, is it? 
It was the feast of the dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's porch. The Jews, therefore, came around him and said to him, How long will you hold us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify about me. But you don't believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I told you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give eternal life to them. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Therefore Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, We don't stone you for a good work, but for blasphemy because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Isn't it written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture can't be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, You blaspheme, because I said I am the Son of God? If I don't do the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do them, though you don't believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. They sought again to seize him, and he went out of their hand. He went away again beyond the Jordan into the place where John was baptizing at first. And he stayed there. Many came to him. They said, John indeed did no sign, but everything that John said about this man is true. Many believed in him there. Chapter 11 Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, of the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who had anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother, Lazarus, was sick. The sisters, therefore, sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he for whom you have great affection is sick. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness is not to death, but for the glory of God, that God's Son may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. When, therefore, he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, Let's go into Judea again. The disciples asked him, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus answered, Aren't there twelve hours of daylight? If a man walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walks in the night, he stumbles because the light isn't in him. He said these things, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going so that I may awake him out of sleep. The disciples therefore said, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he spoke of taking rest in sleep. So Jesus said to them plainly then, Lazarus is dead. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe. Nevertheless, let's go to him. Thomas, therefore, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let's go also so that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had been in the tomb four days already. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about fifteen stadia away. 
Many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Then, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary stayed in the house. Therefore Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will still live, even if he dies. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Christ, God's Son, he who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The teacher is here and is calling you. When she heard this, she arose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and were consoling her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews weeping who came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They told him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. The Jews therefore said, See how much affection he had for him. Some of them said, Couldn't this man, who opened the eyes of him who was blind, have also kept this man from dying? Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see God's glory? So they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you listened to me. I know that you always listen to me, but because of the multitude standing around, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He who was dead came out, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Free him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. The chief priests, therefore, and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What are we doing? For this man does many signs. If we leave him alone like this, Everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is advantageous for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation not perish. Now he didn't say this of himself. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. 
So from that day forward, they took counsel that they might put him to death. Jesus, therefore, walked no more openly among the Jews, but departed from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim. He stayed there with his disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought for Jesus and spoke with one another as they stood in the temple. What do you think, that he isn't coming to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had commanded that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. Chapter 12 then, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there. Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Therefore Mary took a pound of ointment of pure nard, very precious, and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. Then Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, one of his disciples, who would betray him, said, Why wasn't this ointment sold for three hundred denarii and given to the poor? Now he said this, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and having the money box, used to steal what was put into it. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial, for you always have the poor with you, but you don't always have me. A large crowd, therefore, of the Jews learned that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests conspired to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. On the next day, a great multitude had come to the feast. When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel! Jesus, having found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Don't be afraid, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes, sitting on a donkey's coat. His disciples didn't understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him, and that they had done these things to him. The multitude, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead was testifying about it. For this cause also the multitude went and met him, because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, See how you accomplish nothing. Behold, the world has gone after him. Now there were certain Greeks among those that went up to worship at the feast. These, therefore, came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew came with Philip, and they told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Most certainly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled. 
what shall I say? Father, save me from this time. But I came to this time for this cause. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of the sky, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore the multitude who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice hasn't come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. But he said this, signifying by what kind of death he should die. The multitude answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ remains forever. How do you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus therefore said to them, Yet a little while the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, that darkness doesn't overtake you. He who walks in the darkness doesn't know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become children of light. Jesus said these things, and he departed and hid himself from them. But though he had done so many signs before them, Yet they didn't believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this cause they couldn't believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their heart, lest they should see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart and would turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, even many of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees they didn't confess it, so that they wouldn't be put out of the synagogue, for they loved men's praise more than God's praise. Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me may not remain in the darkness. If anyone listens to my sayings and doesn't believe, I don't judge him, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and doesn't receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word that I spoke will judge him in the last day. For I spoke not from myself, but the Father who sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. The things, therefore, which I speak, even as the Father has said to me, so I speak. Chapter 13 Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his time had come that he would depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he came from God, and was going to God, arose from supper, and laid aside his outer garments. He took a towel, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Then he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, You don't know what I am doing now, but you will understand later. Peter said to him, 
you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, Someone who has bathed only needs to have his feet washed, but is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew him who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, put his outer garment back on, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. You say so correctly, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you should also do as I have done to you. Most certainly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is one who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I don't speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But that the scripture may be fulfilled, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I tell you before it happens, that when it happens, you may believe that I am he. Most certainly I tell you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said this, he was troubled in spirit and testified, Most certainly I tell you that one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was at the table, leaning against Jesus' breast. Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom he speaks. He, leaning back as he was on Jesus' breast, asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus, therefore, answered, It is he to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the piece of bread, then Satan entered into him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now nobody at the table knew why he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus said to him, Buy what things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Therefore, having received that morsel, he went out immediately. It was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and he will glorify him immediately. Little children, I will be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you can't come. So now I tell you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, Where I am going, you can't follow now, but you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for me? Most certainly I tell you. The rooster won't crow until you have denied me three times. Chapter 14 Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. 
and my father's house are many homes. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be there also. You know where I go, and you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you such a long time, and do you not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I tell you, I speak not from myself, but the Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Most certainly I tell you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and he will do greater works than these, because I am going to my Father. Whatever you will ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you will ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another counselor, that he may be with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive, for it doesn't see him and doesn't know him. You know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you, yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me and I in you. One who has my commandments and keeps them, that person is one who loves me. One who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what has happened that you are about to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if a man loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who doesn't love me doesn't keep my words. The word which you hear isn't mine, but the Father's who sent me. I have said these things to you while still living with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, I give to you. Don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be fearful. You heard how I told you, I go away and I come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I said, I am going to my Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. I will no more speak much with you, for the Prince of the world comes, and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father commanded me, even so I do. Arise, let's go from here. Chapter 15 
I am the true vine, and my Father is the farmer. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already pruned clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you. As the branch can't bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If a man doesn't remain in me, he is thrown out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, you will ask whatever you desire, and it will be done for you. In this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciples. Even as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have spoken these things to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be made full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his Lord does. But I have called you friends, for everything that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatever you will ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I command these things to you, that you may love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, since I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But they will do all these things to you for my name's sake, because they don't know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have had sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my Father also. If I hadn't done among them the works which no one else did, they wouldn't have had sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my Father. But this happened so that the word may be fulfilled, which was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. When the Counselor has come, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father. He will testify about me. You will also testify, because you have been with me from the beginning. Chapter 16 I have said these things to you so that you wouldn't be caused to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes. The time comes that whoever kills you will think that he offers service to God. They will do these things because they have not known the Father, nor me. But I have told you these things, so that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, Where are you going? But because I have told you these things, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. 
it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the counselor won't come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he has come, he will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. About sin, because they don't believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to my Father, and you won't see me anymore. About judgment, because the prince of this world has been judged. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will declare to you things that are coming. He will glorify me, for he will take from what is mine and will declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will declare it to you. A little while, and you will not see me. Again, a little while, and you will see me. Some of his disciples, therefore, said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you won't see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, and because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, What is this that he says? A little while. We don't know what he is saying. Therefore Jesus perceived that they wanted to ask him, and he said to them, Do you inquire among yourselves concerning this, that I said, a little while and you won't see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Most certainly I tell you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she gives birth, has sorrow because her time has come, but when she has delivered the child, she doesn't remember the anguish any more for the joy that a human being is born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will ask me no questions. Most certainly, I tell you, whatever you may ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be made full. I have spoken these things to you in figures of speech, but the time is coming when I will no more speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I don't say to you that I will pray to the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father, and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world, and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, Behold, now you are speaking plainly, and using no figures of speech. Now we know that you know all things, and don't need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the time is coming, yes, and has now come, that you will be scattered, everyone to his own place, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have told you these things, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have trouble, but cheer up, I have overcome the world. Chapter 17 Jesus said these things. Then, lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, so he will give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This is eternal life that they should know you, the only true God, and him whom you sent, Jesus Christ. 
I glorified you on the earth. I have accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world existed. I revealed your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, and you have given them to me. They have kept your word. Now they have known that all things, whatever you have given me, are from you. For the words which you have given me, I have given to them, and they received them, and knew for sure that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I don't pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them through your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. I have kept those whom you have given me. None of them is lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and I say these things in the world, that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word. The world hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you would take them from the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Not for these only do I pray, but for those also who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected into one, that the world may know that you sent me, and loved them, even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world, Righteous Father, the world hasn't known you, but I knew you, and these knew that you sent me. I made known to them your name, and will make it known, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Chapter 18 When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, into which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having taken a detachment of soldiers and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all the things that were happening to him, went out and said to them, Who are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas also, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When, therefore, he said to them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Again, therefore, he asked them, 
Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the word might be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you have given me, I have lost none. Simon Peter, therefore, having a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus, therefore, said to Peter, Put the sword into its sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not surely drink it? So the detachment, the commanding officer, and the officers of the Jews seized Jesus and bound him, and led him to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should perish for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered in with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought in Peter. Then the maid who kept the door said to Peter, Are you also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers were standing there, having made a fire of coals, for it was cold. They were warming themselves. Peter was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest, therefore, asked Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. I said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Behold, they know the things which I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by slapped Jesus with his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, testify of the evil. But if well, why do you beat me? Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said therefore to him, You aren't also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being a relative of him whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Peter therefore denied it again, and immediately the rooster crowed. They led Jesus therefore from Caiaphas into the praetorium. It was early, and they themselves didn't enter into the praetorium, that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Pilate therefore went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man weren't an evildoer, we wouldn't have delivered him up to you. Pilate therefore said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is illegal for us to put anyone to death, that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he should die. Pilate therefore entered again into the praetorium, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Do you say this by yourself, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight, that I wouldn't be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. 
For this reason I have been born, and for this reason I have come into the world, that I should testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no basis for a charge against him, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Therefore, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all shouted again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Chapter 19 So Pilate then took Jesus and flogged him. The soldiers twisted thorns into a crown and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple garment. They kept saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they kept slapping him. Then Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I bring him out to you, that you may know that I find no basis for a charge against him. Jesus therefore came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple garment. Pilate said to them, Behold, the man! When therefore the chief priests and the officers saw him, they shouted, saying, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When therefore Pilate heard this saying, he was more afraid. He entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Aren't you speaking to me? Don't you know that I have power to release you and have power to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power at all against me unless it were given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you has greater sin. At this, Pilate was seeking to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you aren't Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover at about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold, your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar! So then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. He went out, bearing his cross, to the place called the Place of a Skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, and with him two others, on either side one, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote a title also, and put it on the cross. There was written, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The chief priests of the Jews, therefore, said to Pilate, Don't write, the king of the Jews, but he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also the coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. Then they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it will be. 
that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They parted my garments among them, for my cloak they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by Jesus' cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Therefore, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, seeing that all things were now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I am thirsty. Now a vessel full of vinegar was set there, so they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it at his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Therefore the Jews, because it was the preparation day, so that the bodies wouldn't remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a special one, asked of Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Therefore the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. However, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. He who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth that you may believe. For these things happened that the scripture might be fulfilled. A bone of him will not be broken. Again, another scripture says, They will look on him whom they pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked of Pilate that he might take away Jesus' body. Pilate gave him permission. He came, therefore, and took away his body. Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred Roman pounds. So they took Jesus' body and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden was a new tomb in which no man had ever yet been laid. Then, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was near at hand, they laid Jesus there. Chapter 20 Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went early, while it was still dark, to the tomb, and saw the stone taken away from the tomb. Therefore she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. Therefore Peter and the other disciple went out, and they went toward the tomb. They both ran together. The other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths lying, yet he didn't enter in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and entered into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying, and the cloth that had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. So then the other disciple who came first to the tomb also entered in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they didn't know the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside at the tomb, weeping. So as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. They asked her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, 
because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, and didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Don't hold me, for I haven't yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. When, therefore, it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were locked where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the middle and said to them, Peace be to you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples, therefore, were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus, therefore, said to them again, Peace be to you, as the Father has sent me. Even so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they have been forgiven them. If you retain anyone's sins, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, wasn't with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, again his disciples were inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being locked, and stood in the middle, and said, Peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger, and see my hands. Reach here your hand, and put it into my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God! Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Therefore Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Chapter 21 After these things, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, he revealed himself this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They told him, We are also coming with you. They immediately went out and entered into the boat. That night they caught nothing. But when day had already come, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus therefore said to them, Children, have you anything to eat? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. They cast it, therefore, and now they weren't able to draw it in for the multitude of fish. That disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It's the Lord! So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself, for he was naked, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about two hundred cubits away, dragging the net full of fish. 
So when they got out on the land, they saw a fire of coals there, with fish and bread laid on it. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of 153 great fish. Even though there were so many, the net wasn't torn. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. None of the disciples dared inquire of him, Who are you? knowing that it was the Lord. Then Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was revealed to his disciples after he had risen from the dead. So when they had eaten their breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I have affection for you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I have affection for you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you have affection for me? Peter was grieved because he asked him the third time, Do you have affection for me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I have affection for you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Most certainly, I tell you, when you were young, you dressed yourself and walked where you wanted to. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. Now he said this, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. When he had said this, he said to him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw a disciple following. This was the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who had also leaned on Jesus' breast at the supper and asked, Lord, who is going to betray you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I desire that he stay until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. This saying, therefore, went out among the brothers, that this disciple wouldn't die. Yet Jesus didn't say to him that he wouldn't die, but if I desire that he stay until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies about these things and wrote these things. We know that his witness is true. There are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they would all be written, I suppose that even the world itself wouldn't have room for the books that would be written. Acts Chapter 1 the first book I wrote, Theophilus, concerned all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was received up, after he had given commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also showed himself alive after he suffered by many proofs, appearing to them over a period of forty days and speaking about God's kingdom. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them, Don't depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which you heard from me. For John indeed baptized in water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you now restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it isn't for you to know times or seasons which the Father has set within his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. When he had said these things, as they were looking, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. While they were looking steadfastly into the sky as he went, behold, 
two men stood by them in white clothing, who also said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who was received up from you into the sky, will come back in the same way as you saw him going into the sky. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had come in, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, that is, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, continued steadfastly in prayer and supplication, along with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In these days Peter stood up in the middle of the disciples, and the number of names was about one hundred twenty, and said, Brothers, it was necessary that this scripture should be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who was guide to those who took Jesus. For he was counted with us and received his portion in this ministry. Now this man obtained a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines gushed out. It became known to everyone who lived in Jerusalem that in their language that field was called a keldama, that is, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be made desolate, let no one dwell in it, and let another take his office. Of the men, therefore, who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day that he was received up from us. Of these, one must become a witness with us of his resurrection. They put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justus, and Matthias. They prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas fell away, that he might go to his own place. They drew lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was counted with the eleven apostles. Chapter 2 Now when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly, there came from the sky a sound like the rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Tongues like fire appeared and were distributed to them, and one sat on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages, as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under the sky, when this sound was heard, the multitude came together and were bewildered, because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, aren't all these who speak Galileans? How do we hear everyone in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them speaking in our own languages, the mighty works of God. They were all amazed and were perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? Others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and spoke out to them, You men of Judea, and all you who dwell at Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to my words. For these aren't drunken, as you suppose, 
seeing it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel. It will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Yes, and on my servants and on my handmaidens in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. It will be that whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God to you by mighty works and wonders and signs which God did by him among you, even as you yourselves know. Him being delivered up by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by the hand of lawless men, crucified and killed, whom God raised up, having freed him from the agony of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore, my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh also will dwell in hope, because you will not leave my soul in Hades. Neither will you allow your Holy One to see decay. You made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may tell you freely of the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul wasn't left in Hades, and his flesh didn't see decay. This Jesus God raised up, to which we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted by the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, which you now see and hear. For David didn't descend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit by my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Let all the house of Israel, therefore, know certainly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. With many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. There were added that day about 3,000 souls. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayer. Fear came on every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and distributed them to all according as anyone had need. Day by day, continuing steadfastly with one accord in the temple and breaking bread at home, they took their food with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. The Lord added to the assembly day by day those who were being saved.
Chapter 3 Peter and John were going up into the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. A certain man, who was lame from his mother's womb, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the door of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask gifts for the needy of those who entered into the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive gifts for the needy. Peter, fastening his eyes on him with John, said, Look at us. He listened to them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, that I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. He took him by the right hand and raised him up. Immediately, his feet and his ankle bones received strength. Leaping up, he stood and began to walk. He entered with them into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him, that it was he who used to sit begging for gifts for the needy at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. As the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. When Peter saw it, he responded to the people, You men of Israel, why do you marvel at this man? Why do you fasten your eyes on us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had determined to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead, to which we are witnesses. By faith in his name, his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which is through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now, brothers, I know that you did this in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But the things which God announced by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, so that there may come times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Christ Jesus, who was ordained for you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God spoke long ago by the mouth of his holy prophets. For Moses indeed said to the fathers, The Lord God will raise up a prophet for you from among your brothers like me, you shall listen to him in all things, whatever he says to you. It will be that every soul that will not listen to that prophet will be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who followed after, as many as have spoken, they also told of these days. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed through your offspring. God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to you first to bless you in turning away every one of you from your wickedness. Chapter 4 As they spoke to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came to them, being upset because they taught the people and proclaimed in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them, and put them in custody until the next day, for it was now evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about five thousand. In the morning, their rulers, elders, and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and as many as were relatives of the high priest. 
when they had stood Peter and John in the middle of them, they inquired, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we are examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, may it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, this man stands here before you whole in him. He is the stone which was regarded as worthless by you, the builders, which has become the head of the corner. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that is given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and had perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. Seeing the man who was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? Because indeed a notable miracle has been done through them, as can be plainly seen by all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But so that this spreads no further among the people, let's threaten them that from now on they don't speak to anyone in this name. They called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach, in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, judge for yourselves, for we can't help telling the things which we saw and heard. When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them, because of the people, for everyone glorified God for that which was done. For the man on whom this miracle of healing was performed was more than forty years old. Being let go, they came to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, O Lord, you are God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them who by the mouth of your servant David said, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth take a stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your counsel foreordained to happen. Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were gathered together. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. The multitude of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Not one of them claimed that anything of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great grace was on them all, for neither was there among them any who lacked. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made to each according as anyone had need. Joseph, who by the apostles was also called Barnabas, which is, being interpreted, son of encouragement, a Levite, a man of Cyprus by race, having a field, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Chapter 5 But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, 
sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being aware of it, then brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? While you kept it, didn't it remain your own? After it was sold, wasn't it in your power? How is it that you have conceived this thing in your heart? You haven't lied to men, but to God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and died. Great fear came on all who heard these things. The young men arose and wrapped him up, and they carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife, not knowing what had happened, came in. Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. But Peter asked her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. She fell down immediately at his feet and died. The young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her by her husband. Great fear came on the whole assembly and on all who heard these things. By the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. They were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. None of the rest dared to join them. However, the people honored them. More believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. They even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mattresses, so that as Peter came by, at the least his shadow might overshadow some of them. The multitude also came together from the cities around Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy and laid hands on the apostles, then put them in public custody. But an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors by night and brought them out and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. When they heard this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and taught. But the high priest came, and those who were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But the officers who came didn't find them in the prison. They returned and reported, we found the prison shut and locked, and the guards standing before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priests heard these words, they were very perplexed about them and what might become of this. One came and told them, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are in the temple standing and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they were afraid that the people might stone them. When they had brought them, they set them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, Didn't we strictly command you not to teach in this name? Behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you killed, hanging him on a tree. God exalted him with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and remission of sins. We are his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. But they, when they heard this, 
were cut to the heart and were determined to kill them. But one stood up in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, honored by all the people, and commanded to put the apostles out for a little while. He said to them, You men of Israel, be careful concerning these men what you are about to do. For before these days, Theudas rose up, making himself out to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves. He was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the enrollment and drew away some people after him. He also perished, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered abroad. Now I tell you, withdraw from these men and leave them alone. For if this counsel or this work is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow it, and you would be found even to be fighting against God. They agreed with him. Summoning the apostles, they beat them and commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. They therefore departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for Jesus' name. Every day, in the temple and at home, they never stopped teaching and preaching Jesus the Christ. Chapter 6 Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, a complaint arose from the Hellenists against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily service. The twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not appropriate for us to forsake the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, select from among you, brothers, seven men of good report, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will continue steadfastly in prayer and in the ministry of the word. These words pleased the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. When they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. The word of God increased, and the number of the disciples greatly multiplied in Jerusalem. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Stephen, full of faith and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. But some of those who were of the synagogue, called the Libertines, and of the Cyrenians, of the Alexandrians, and of those of Cilicia and Asia, arose, disputing with Stephen. They weren't able to withstand the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and came against him and seized him, then brought him in to the council and set up false witnesses who said, this man never stopped speaking blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs which Moses delivered to us. All who sat in the council, fastening their eyes on him, saw his face like it was the face of an angel. Chapter 7 the high priest said, Are these things so? He said, Brothers and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your land and away from your relatives, and come into a land which I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. From there, 
when his father was dead, God moved him into this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. He promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his offspring after him. When he still had no child, God spoke in this way that his offspring would live as aliens in a strange land, and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for four hundred years. I will judge the nation to which they will be in bondage, said God, and after that they will come out and serve me in this place. He gave him the covenant of circumcision, so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. The patriarchs, moved with jealousy against Joseph, sold him into Egypt. God was with him and delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction. Our fathers found no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers the first time. On the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's race was revealed to Pharaoh. Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his relatives, seventy-five souls. Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, himself and our fathers and they were brought back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a price in silver from the children of Hamor of Shechem. But as the time of the promise came close, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt until there arose a different king who didn't know Joseph. The same took advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers and forced them to throw out their babies so that they wouldn't stay alive. At that time, Moses was born and was exceedingly handsome. He was nourished three months in his father's house. When he was thrown out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and reared him as her own son. Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was mighty in his words and works. But when he was forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. Seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him who was oppressed, striking the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers understood that God, by his hand, was giving them deliverance. But they didn't understand. The day following, he appeared to them as they fought, and urged them to be at peace again, saying, Sirs, you are brothers, why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Moses fled at this saying, and became a stranger in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. When forty years were fulfilled, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in a flame of fire, in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. As he came close to see, a voice of the Lord came to him, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses trembled and dared not look. The Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people that is in Egypt, and have heard their groaning. I have come down to deliver them. Now come, I will send you into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? God has sent him as both a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, having worked wonders and signs in Egypt, in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for forty years. 
This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord our God will raise up a prophet for you from among your brothers, like me. This is he who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel that spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, who received living revelations to give to us, to whom our fathers wouldn't be obedient, but rejected him and turned back in their hearts to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods that will go before us. For as for this Moses, who led us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. They made a calf in those days and brought a sacrifice to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their hands. But God turned and gave them up to serve the army of the sky as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer to me slain animals and sacrifices forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tabernacle of Moloch the star of your God, Rephan, the figures which you made to worship. I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of the testimony in the wilderness, even as he who spoke to Moses commanded him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which also our fathers, in their turn, brought in with Joshua when they entered into the possession of the nations whom God drove out before the face of our fathers to the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a habitation for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and the earth a footstool for my feet. What kind of house will you build me? says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Didn't my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so you do. Which of the prophets didn't your fathers persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one of whom you have now become betrayers and murderers. You received the law as it was ordained by angels and didn't keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, then rushed at him with one accord. They threw him out of the city, and stoned him. The witnesses placed their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. They stoned Stephen, as he called out, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Chapter 8 Saul was consenting to his death a great persecution arose against the assembly which was in Jerusalem in that day. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and lamented greatly over him. But Saul ravaged the assembly, entering into every house and dragged both men and women off to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered abroad went around preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. The multitudes listened with one accord to the things that were spoken by Philip when they heard and saw the signs which he did. For unclean spirits came out of many of those who had them. They came out, crying with a loud voice. Many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. 
there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man, Simon by name, who used to practice sorcery in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, making himself out to be some great one, to whom they all listened, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is that great power of God. They listened to him, because for a long time he had amazed them with his sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching good news concerning God's kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself also believed. Being baptized, he continued with Philip. Seeing signs and great miracles occurring, he was amazed. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had fallen on none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of Christ Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that whomever I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart isn't right before God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and ask God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the poison of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that none of the things which you have spoken happen to me. They, therefore, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem, and preached the good news to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, to the way that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert. He arose and went, and behold, there was a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace queen of the Ethiopians, who was over all her treasure, who had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, Go near and join yourself to this chariot. Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and said, Do you understand what you are reading? He said, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? He begged Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he doesn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip, Who is the prophet talking about? About himself or about someone else? Philip opened his mouth and, beginning from this scripture, preached to him about Jesus. As they went on the way, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Behold, here is water. What is keeping me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stand still. And they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, and the eunuch didn't see him any more, for he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus. Passing through, he preached the good news to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Chapter 9 But Saul, still breathing threats and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him 
to the synagogues of Damascus, that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he traveled, he got close to Damascus, and suddenly a light from the sky shone around him. He fell on the earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, Who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise up and enter into the city. Then you will be told what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. They led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He was without sight for three days, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, it's me, Lord. The Lord said to him, Arise, and go to the street which is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judah for one named Saul a man of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him, that he might receive his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he did to your saints at Jerusalem. Here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go your way, for he is my chosen vessel to bear my name before the nations and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Ananias departed and entered into the house. Laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he received his sight. He arose and was baptized. He took food and was strengthened. Saul stayed several days with the disciples who were at Damascus. Immediately in the synagogues, he proclaimed the Christ, that he is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Isn't this he who in Jerusalem made havoc of those who called on this name? And he had come here, intending to bring them bound before the chief priests. But Saul increased more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived at Damascus, proving that this is the Christ. When many days were fulfilled, the Jews conspired together to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They watched the gates both day and night that they might kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall, luring him in a basket. When Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. He was with them entering into Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. He spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. When the brothers knew it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the assemblies throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were built up. They were multiplied, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. As Peter went throughout all those parts, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years because he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, 
Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. Immediately he arose. All who lived at Lydda and in Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which, when translated, means Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and acts of mercy, which she did. In those days she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. As Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Peter got up and went with them. When he had come, they brought him into the upper room. All the widows stood by him, weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and raised her up. Calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. This became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. He stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. Chapter 10 Now there was a certain man in Caesarea, Cornelius by name, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his house who gave gifts for the needy generously to the people, and always prayed to God. At about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius. He, fastening his eyes on him and being frightened, said, What is it, Lord? He said to him, Your prayers and your gifts to the needy have gone up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa, and get Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of those who waited on him continually. Having explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now on the next day, as they were on their journey and got close to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray at about noon. He became hungry and desired to eat. But while they were preparing, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and a certain container descending to him, like a great sheet let down by four corners on the earth in which were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild animals, reptiles, and birds of the sky. A voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. A voice came to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call unclean. This was done three times, and immediately the vessel was received up into heaven. Now, while Peter was very perplexed in himself what the vision which he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was lodging there. While Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men seek you, but arise, get down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. Why have you come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion a righteous man and one who fears God and well spoken of by all the nation of the Jews, was directed by a holy angel to invite you to his house and to listen to what you say. 
So he called them in and provided a place to stay. On the next day, Peter arose and went out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. On the next day, they entered into Caesarea. Cornelius was waiting for them, having called together his relatives and his near friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up. I myself am also a man. As he talked with him, he went in and found many gathered together. He said to them, You yourselves know how it is an unlawful thing for a man who is a Jew to join himself or come to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I shouldn't call any man unholy or unclean. Therefore, I also came without complaint when I was sent for. I ask, therefore, why did you send for me? Cornelius said, Four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer is heard, and your gifts to the needy are remembered in the sight of God. Send, therefore, to Joppa, and summoned Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying in the house of a tanner named Simon by the seaside. When he comes, he will speak to you. Therefore I sent to you at once, and it was good of you to come. Now, therefore, we are all here present in the sight of God to hear all things that have been commanded you by God. Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I perceive that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, he who fears him and works righteousness is acceptable to him. The word which he sent to the children of Israel, preaching good news of peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. Even Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they also killed, hanging him on a tree. God raised him up the third day and gave him to be revealed not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen before by God, to us, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that this is he who is appointed by God as the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that through his name, everyone who believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. They of the circumcision who believed were amazed, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was also poured out on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in other languages and magnifying God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just like us. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay some days. Chapter 11 Now the apostles and the brothers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. When Peter had come up to Jerusalem, those who were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained to them in order, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain container descending like it was a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners. It came as far as me. When I had looked intently at it, I considered and saw the four-footed animals of the earth, wild animals, creeping things, and birds of the sky. 
I also heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered into my mouth. But a voice answered me the second time out of heaven, What God has cleansed don't you call unclean. This was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. Behold, immediately three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent from Caesarea to me. The Spirit told me to go with them without discriminating. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying to him, Send to Joppa and get Simon, who is called Peter who will speak to you words by which you will be saved, you and all your house. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, even as on us at the beginning. I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized in water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. If then God gave to them the same gift as us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I? that I could withstand God. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. They, therefore, who were scattered abroad by the oppression that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews only. But there were some of them men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. The report concerning them came to the ears of the assembly, which was in Jerusalem. They sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch, who, when he had come and had seen the grace of God, was glad. He exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they should remain near to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and many people were added to the Lord. Barnabas went out to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they were gathered together with the assembly and taught many people. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and indicated by the Spirit that there should be a great famine all over the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius. As any of the disciples had plenty, each determined to send relief to the brothers who lived in Judea, which they also did sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Chapter 12 Now about that time, King Herod stretched out his hands to oppress some of the assembly. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of four soldiers each to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. Peter, therefore, was kept in the prison, but constant prayer was made by the assembly to God for him. The same night when Herod was about to bring him out, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. Guards in front of the door kept the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up, saying, Stand up, quickly. His chains fell off his hands. The angel said to him, Get dressed and put on your sandals. He did so. He said to him, Put on your cloak and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He didn't know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard, 
they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. They went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I truly know that the Lord has sent out his angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from everything the Jewish people were expecting. Thinking about that, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, she didn't open the gate for joy, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, You are crazy. But she insisted that it was so. They said, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. When they had opened, they saw him and were amazed. But he, beckoning to them with his hand to be silent, declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. He said, Tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. When Herod had sought for him and didn't find him, he examined the guards, then commanded that they should be put to death. He went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Now Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They came with one accord to him, and, having made Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod dressed himself in royal clothing, sat on the throne, and gave a speech to them. The people shouted, The voice of a god, and not of a man! Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, because he didn't give God the glory. Then he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their service, also taking with them John, who was called Mark. Chapter 13 Now in the assembly that was at Antioch, there were some prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they served the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate Barnabas and Saul for me, for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. From there they sailed to Cyprus. When they were at Salamis, they proclaimed God's word in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John as their attendant. When they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of understanding. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul, and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fastened his eyes on him and said, You son of the devil, full of all deceit and all cunning, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is on you, and you will be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. Immediately a mist and darkness fell on him. He went around, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul, when he saw what was done, believed, 
being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his company set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. But they, passing on from Perga, came to Antioch of Pisidia. They went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, speak. Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people chose our fathers and exalted the people when they stayed as aliens in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he led them out of it. For a period of about forty years he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land for an inheritance for about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Afterward, they asked for a king, and God gave to them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. When he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, to whom he also testified. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From this man's offspring, God has brought salvation to Israel, according to his promise. Before his coming, when John had first preached the baptism of repentance to Israel, as John was fulfilling his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. But behold, one comes after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, children of the stock of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, the word of this salvation is sent out to you. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they didn't know him, nor the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. Though they found no cause for death, they still asked Pilate to have him killed. When they had fulfilled all things that were written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. We bring you good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this to us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have become your father. Concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay. For David, after he had in his own generation served the counsel of God, fell asleep, was laid with his fathers, and saw decay. But he whom God raised up saw no decay. Be it known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man is proclaimed to you remission of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come on you which is spoken in the prophets. Behold, you scoffers, and wonder, and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will in no way believe if one declares it to you. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the synagogue broke up, many of the Jews and of the devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city was gathered together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with jealousy and contradicted the things which were spoken by Paul 
and blasphemed. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that God's word should be spoken to you first, since indeed you thrust it from yourselves and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so has the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set you as a light for the Gentiles, that you should bring salvation to the uttermost parts of the earth. As the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of God. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. The Lord's word was spread abroad throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city and stirred up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and threw them out of their borders. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them, and came to Iconium. The disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 14 In Iconium they entered together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spoke that a great multitude, both of Jews and of Greeks, believed. But the disbelieving Jews stirred up and embittered the souls of the Gentiles against the brothers. Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who testified to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, and part with the apostles when some of both the Gentiles and the Jews, with their rulers, made a violent attempt to mistreat and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lycaonia, Lystra, Derbe, and the surrounding region. There they preached the good news. At Lystra, a certain man sat, impotent in his feet, a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. He was listening to Paul speaking, who, fastening eyes on him and seeing that he had faith to be made whole, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. He leaped up and walked. When the multitude saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voice, saying in the language of Lycaonia, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. They called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul, Mercury, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Jupiter, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, and would have made a sacrifice along with the multitudes. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their clothes and sprang into the multitude, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to the living God, who made the sky, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who in the generations gone by allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he didn't leave himself without witness, in that he did good and gave you rains from the sky, and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things, they hardly stopped the multitudes from making a sacrifice to them. But some Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But as the disciples stood around him, he rose up and entered into the city. On the next day he went out with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the good news to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that through many afflictions we must enter into God's kingdom. When they had appointed elders for them in every assembly and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord, on whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. 
when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Adaliah. From there they sailed to Antioch, from where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. When they had arrived and had gathered the assembly together, they reported all the things that God had done with them and that he had opened a door of faith to the nations. They stayed there with the disciples for a long time. Chapter 15 Some men came down from Judea and taught the brothers, Unless you are circumcised after the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small discord and discussion with them, they appointed Paul and Barnabas and some others of them to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. They, being sent on their way by the assembly, passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. They caused great joy to all the brothers. When they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the assembly and the apostles and the elders, and they reported everything that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to see about this matter. When there had been much discussion, Peter rose up and said to them, Brothers, you know that a good while ago, God made a choice among you that by my mouth the nations should hear the word of the good news and believe. God, who knows the heart, testified about them, giving them the Holy Spirit just like he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you tempt God that you should put a yoke on the neck of the disciples? which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. All the multitude kept silence, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul, reporting what signs and wonders God had done among the nations through them. After they were silent, James answered, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has reported how God first visited the nations to take out of them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets, as it is written, After these things I will return. I will again build the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. I will again build its ruins. I will set it up, that the rest of men may seek after the Lord. All the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. All of God's works are known to him from eternity. Therefore, my judgment is that we don't trouble those from among the Gentiles who turn to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from the pollution of idols, from sexual immorality, from what is strangled, and from blood. For Moses, from generations of old, has in every city those who preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders, with the whole assembly, to choose men out of their company and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brothers. They wrote these things by their hand. The apostles, the elders, and the brothers to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings, because we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, You must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no commandment. It seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose out men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who themselves will also tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us 
to lay no greater burden on you than these necessary things, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality, from which, if you keep yourselves, it will be well with you. Farewell. So, when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. Having gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they read it, they rejoiced over the encouragement. Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged the brothers with many words and strengthened them. After they had spent some time there, they were sent back with greetings from the brothers to the apostles. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's return now and visit our brothers in every city in which we proclaimed the word of the Lord to see how they are doing. Barnabas planned to take John, who was called Mark, with them also. But Paul didn't think that it was a good idea to take with them someone who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and didn't go with them to do the work. Then the contention grew so sharp that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and went out, being commended by the brothers to the grace of God. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the assemblies. Chapter 16 He came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, named Timothy, the son of a Jewess who believed, but his father was a Greek. The brothers who were at Lystra and Iconium gave a good testimony about him. Paul wanted to have him go out with him, and he took and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered the decrees to them to keep, which had been ordained by the apostles and elders who were at Jerusalem. So the assemblies were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. When they had gone through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come opposite Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit didn't allow them. Passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. There was a man of Macedonia standing, begging him and saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go out to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the good news to them. Setting sail, therefore, from Troas, we made a straight course to Samothrace, and the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a city of Macedonia, the foremost of the district, a Roman colony. We were staying some days in this city. On the Sabbath day, we went outside of the city by a riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, one who worshipped God, heard us. The Lord opened her heart to listen to the things which were spoken by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. So she persuaded us. As we were going to prayer, a certain girl, having a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much gain by fortune-telling. Following Paul and us, she cried out, these men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us a way of salvation. She was doing this for many days. But Paul, becoming greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. It came out that very hour. 
But when her masters saw that the hope of their gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. When they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men, being Jews, are agitating our city and advocate customs which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. The multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore their clothes from them, then commanded them to be beaten with rods. When they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were loosened. The jailer, being roused out of sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew his sword and was about to kill himself supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Don't harm yourself, for we are all here. He called for lights, sprang in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was immediately baptized, he and all his household. He brought them up into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly with all his household, having believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants, saying, Let those men go. The jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, come out and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly without a trial, men who are Romans, and have cast us into prison. Do they now release us secretly? No, most certainly. But let them come themselves and bring us out. The sergeants reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans, and they came and begged them. When they had brought them out, they asked them to depart from the city. They went out of the prison and entered into Lydia's house. When they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them, then departed. Chapter 17 now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. Paul, as was his custom, went in to them, and for three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. Of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and not a few of the chief women. But the unpersuaded Jews took along some wicked men from the marketplace, and gathering a crowd, set the city in an uproar. Assaulting the house of Jason, they sought to bring them out to the people. When they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and certain brothers before the rulers of the city crying, These who have turned the world upside down have come here also, whom Jason has received. These all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. The multitude and the rulers of the city were troubled when they heard these things. When they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, 
examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed, also of the prominent Greek women, and not a few men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there likewise, agitating the multitudes. Then the brothers immediately sent out Paul to go as far as to the sea, and Silas and Timothy still stayed there. But those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens. Receiving a commandment to Silas and Timothy that they should come to him very quickly, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who met him. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also were conversing with him. Some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be advocating foreign deities because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. They took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are speaking about? For you bring certain strange things to our ears. We want to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers living there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious in all things. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, I announce to you, the God who made the world and all things in it, he, being Lord of heaven and earth, doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He isn't served by men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. He made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the surface of the earth, having determined appointed seasons and the boundaries of their dwellings, that they should seek the Lord if perhaps they might reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live, move, and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, engraved by art and design of man, the times of ignorance, therefore, God overlooked. But now he commands that all people everywhere should repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, of which he has given assurance to all men, in that he has raised him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we want to hear you again concerning this. Thus Paul went out from among them. But certain men joined with him and believed, among whom also was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Chapter 18 After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, he found a certain Jew named Aquila, a man of Pontus by race, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. He came to them, and because he practiced the same trade, he lived with them and worked, for by trade they were tent makers. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. When they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook out his clothing and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. 
From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. He departed there and went into the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his house. Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Don't be afraid, but speak, and don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city. He lived there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews, with one accord, rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If indeed it were a matter of wrong or of wicked crime, you Jews, it would be reasonable that I should bear with you. But if there are questions about words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I don't want to be a judge of these matters. So he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. Gallio didn't care about any of these things. Paul, having stayed after this many more days, took his leave of the brothers, and sailed from there for Syria, together with Priscilla and Aquila. He shaved his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. He came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay with them a longer time, he declined, but taking his leave of them, he said, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the assembly and went down to Antioch. Having spent some time there, he departed and went through the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, establishing all the disciples. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by race, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus. He was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, although he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. When he had determined to pass over into Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to receive him. When he had come, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted the Jews, publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Chapter 19 While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus and found certain disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said to him, No, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. He said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with other languages and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. He entered into the synagogue and spoke boldly for a period of three months, reasoning and persuading about the things concerning God's kingdom. But when some were hardened and disobedient, 
speaking evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all those who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. God worked special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were carried away from his body to the sick, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out. But some of the itinerant Jews, exorcists, took on themselves to invoke over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. There were seven sons of one Siva, a Jewish chief priest, who did this. The evil spirit answered, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? The man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, who lived at Ephesus. Fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Many also of those who had believed came, confessing and declaring their deeds. Many of those who practiced magical arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. They counted their price and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing and becoming mighty. Now after these things had ended, Paul determined in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. Having sent into Macedonia two of those who served him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time there arose no small disturbance concerning the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen whom he gathered together with the workmen of like occupation and said sirs you know that by this business we have our wealth you see and hear that not at ephesus alone but almost throughout all asia this paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are no gods that are made with hands not only is there danger that this, our trade, come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be counted as nothing, and her majesty destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worships. When they heard this, they were filled with anger, and cried out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The whole city was filled with confusion and they rushed with one accord into the theater, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel. When Paul wanted to enter into the people, the disciples didn't allow him. Certain also of the Asiarchs, being his friends, sent to him and begged him not to venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion. Most of them didn't know why they had come together. They brought Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. Alexander beckoned with his hand and would have made a defense to the people. But when they perceived that he was a Jew, all with one voice for a time of about two hours cried out, Great, Great is Artemis, Artemis of, of the Ephesians. Ephesians! When the town clerk had quieted the multitude, he said, you men of Ephesus, what man is there who doesn't know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great goddess Artemis and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Seeing then that these things can't be denied, you ought to be quiet and to do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. 
If, therefore, Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a matter against anyone, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them press charges against one another. But if you seek anything about other matters, it will be settled in the regular assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused concerning today's riot, there being no cause. Concerning it, we wouldn't be able to give an account of this commotion. When he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Chapter 20 After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, took leave of them, and departed to go into Macedonia. When he had gone through those parts, and had encouraged them with many words, he came into Greece. When he had spent three months there, and a plot was made against him by Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he determined to return through Macedonia. These accompanied him as far as Asia, Sopater of Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, Gaius of Derby, Timothy, and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. But these had gone ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. We sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came to them at Troas in five days, where we stayed seven days. On the first day of the week, when the disciples were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and continued his speech until midnight. There were many lights in the upper room where we were gathered together. A certain young man named Eutychus sat in the window, weighed down with deep sleep. As Paul spoke still longer, being weighed down by his sleep, he fell down from the third floor and was taken up dead. Paul went down and fell upon him, and embracing him, said, Don't be troubled, for his life is in him. When he had gone up and had broken bread and eaten and had talked with them a long while, even until break of day, he departed. They brought the boy in alive and were greatly comforted. But we, going ahead to the ship, set sail for Azos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for he had so arranged, intending himself to go by land. When he met us at Azos, we took him aboard and came to Mytilene. Sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Caius. The next day we touched at Samos, and stayed at Trogilium, and the day after we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail past Ephesus, that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening, if it were possible for him, to be in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and called to himself the elders of the assembly. When they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you all the time, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears, and with trials which happened to me by the plots of the Jews, how I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus. Now, behold, I go bound by the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions wait for me. But these things don't count, nor do I hold my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to fully testify to the good news of the grace of God. Now, behold, I know that you all, among whom I went about preaching God's kingdom, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you today that I am clean from the blood of all men, for I didn't shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God, Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers 
to shepherd the assembly of the Lord and God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, vicious wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will arise from among your own selves, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, watch, remembering that for a period of three years I didn't cease to admonish everyone night and day with tears. Now, brothers, I entrust you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver, gold, or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands served my necessities and those who were with me. In all things I gave you an example, that so laboring you ought to help the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had spoken these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. They all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all because of the word which he had spoken, that they should see his face no more. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Chapter 21 When we had departed from them and had set sail, we came with a straight course to Cos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. Having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left hand, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre for the ship was there to unload her cargo. Having found disciples, we stayed there seven days. These said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. When those days were over, we departed and went on our journey. They all, with wives and children, brought us on our way until we were out of the city. Kneeling down on the beach, we prayed, after saying goodbye to each other, we went on board the ship, and they returned home again. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemaeus. We greeted the brothers and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea. We entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. As we stayed there some days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming to us and taking Paul's belt, he bound his own feet and hands and said, The Holy Spirit says, So the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and will deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard these things, both we and the people of that place begged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The Lord's will be done. After these days, we took up our baggage and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also went with us, bringing one Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we would stay. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. The day following, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he reported one by one the things which God had worked among the Gentiles through his ministry. They, when they heard it, glorified God. They said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. They have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children and not to walk after the customs 
What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and purify yourself with them, and pay their expenses for them, that they may shave their heads. Then all will know that there is no truth in the things that they have been informed about you, but that you yourself also walk, keeping the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written our decision that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from food offered to idols, from blood, from strangled things, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day purified himself, and went with them into the temple, declaring the fulfillment of the days of purification, until the offering was offered for every one of them. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the multitude and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. All the city was moved, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. Immediately the doors were shut. As they were trying to kill him, news came up to the commanding officer of the regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Immediately he took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. They, when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, stopped beating Paul. Then the commanding officer came near, arrested him, commanded him to be bound with two chains, and inquired who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing and some another among the crowd. When he couldn't find out the truth because of the noise, he commanded him to be brought into the barracks. When he came to the stairs, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, Away with him! As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he asked the commanding officer, May I speak to you? He said, Do you know Greek? Aren't you then the Egyptian, who before these days stirred up to sedition and led out into the wilderness the four thousand men of the assassins? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city. I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. When he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, beckoned with his hand to the people. When there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, Chapter 22 Brothers and fathers, listen to the defense which I now make to you. When they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they were even more quiet. He said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, instructed according to the strict tradition of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, even as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders testify, from whom also I received letters to the brothers, and traveled to Damascus to bring them also who were there to Jerusalem in bonds to be punished. As I made my journey and came close to Damascus about noon, suddenly a great light shone around me from the sky. I fell to the ground, and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, Who are you, Lord? He said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. Those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid. 
but they didn't understand the voice of him who spoke to me. I said, What shall I do, Lord? The Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus. There you will be told about all things which are appointed for you to do. When I couldn't see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. One Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well reported of by all the Jews who lived in Damascus, came to me, and standing by me, said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. In that very hour I looked up at him. He said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will, and to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now, why do you wait? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. When I had returned to Jerusalem, and while I prayed in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not receive testimony concerning me from you. I said, Lord, they themselves know that I am imprisoned and beat in every synagogue those who believed in you. When the blood of Stephen, your witness, was shed, I also was standing by, consenting to his death and guarding the cloaks of those who killed him. He said to me, Depart, for I will send you out far from here, to the Gentiles. They listened to him until he said that. Then they lifted up their voice and said, Rid the earth of this fellow, for he isn't fit to live. As they cried out, threw off their cloaks, and threw dust into the air, the commanding officer commanded him to be brought into the barracks, ordering him to be examined by scourging, that he might know for what crime they shouted against him like that. When they had tied him up with thongs, Paul asked the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and not found guilty? When the centurion heard it, he went to the commanding officer and told him, Watch what you are about to do, for this man is a Roman. The commanding officer came and asked him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes. The commanding officer answered, I bought my citizenship for a great price. Paul said, But I was born a Roman. Immediately those who were about to examine him departed from him, and the commanding officer also was afraid when he realized that he was a Roman, because he had bound him. But on the next day, desiring to know the truth about why he was accused by the Jews, he freed him from the bonds and commanded the chief priests and all the council to come together and brought Paul down and set him before them. Chapter 23 Paul, looking steadfastly at the council, said, Brothers, I have lived before God in all good conscience until today. The high priest, Ananias, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to judge me according to the law and command me to be struck contrary to the law? Those who stood by said, Do you malign God's high priest? Paul said, I didn't know, brothers, that he was high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. When he had said this, an argument arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the crowd was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor a spirit. But the Pharisees confess all of these. A great clamor arose, 
and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' part stood up and contended, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or angel has spoken to him, let's not fight against God. When a great argument arose, the commanding officer, fearing that Paul would be torn in pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Cheer up, Paul, for as you have testified about me at Jerusalem, so you must testify also at Rome. When it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than forty people who had made this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you, with the council, inform the commanding officer that he should bring him down to you tomorrow, as though you were going to judge his case more exactly. We are ready to kill him before he comes near. But Paul's sister's son heard they were lying in wait, and he came and entered into the barracks and told Paul. Paul summoned one of the centurions and said, Bring this young man to the commanding officer, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commanding officer and said, Paul, the prisoner, summoned me and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to tell you. The commanding officer took him by the hand, and going aside, asked him privately, What is it that you have to tell me? He said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though intending to inquire somewhat more accurately concerning him. Therefore don't yield to them, for more than forty men lie in wait for him, who have bound themselves under a curse to neither eat nor drink until they have killed him. Now they are ready, looking for the promise from you. So the commanding officer let the young man go, charging him, Tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. He called to himself two of the centurions and said, Prepare two hundred soldiers to go as far as Caesarea, with seventy horsemen and two hundred men armed with spears at the third hour of the night. He asked them to provide animals that they might set Paul on one and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. He wrote a letter like this, Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor, Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. Desiring to know the cause why they accused him, I brought him down to their council. I found him to be accused about questions of their law, but not to be charged with anything worthy of death or of imprisonment. When I was told that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him to you immediately, charging his accusers also to bring their accusations against him before you. Farewell. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. But on the next day, they left the horsemen to go with him and returned to the barracks. When they came to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. When the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. When he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you fully when your accusers also arrive. He commanded that he be kept in Herod's palace. Chapter 24 After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with certain elders and an orator, one Tertullus. They informed the governor against Paul. When he was called, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by you we enjoy much peace, and that prosperity is coming to this nation by your foresight. We accept it in all ways and in all places, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness. 
But that I don't delay you, I entreat you to bear with us and hear a few words. For we have found this man to be a plague, an instigator of insurrections among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we arrested him. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the attack, affirming that these things were so. When the governor had beckoned him to speak, Paul answered, Because I know that you have been a judge of this nation for many years, I cheerfully make my defense, seeing that you can verify that it is not more than twelve days since I went up to worship at Jerusalem. In the temple they didn't find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove to you the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that after the way which they call a sect, so I serve the God of our fathers, believing all things which are according to the law and which are written in the prophets, having hope toward God, which these also themselves look for, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. In this I also practice, always having a conscience void of offense toward God and men. Now, after some years, I came to bring gifts for the needy to my nation and offerings, amid which certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, not with a mob nor with turmoil, they ought to have been here before you and to make accusation if they had anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what injustice they found in me when I stood before the council, unless it is for this one thing that I cried standing among them. Concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged before you today. But Felix, having more exact knowledge concerning the way, deferred them, saying, when Lysias, the commanding officer, comes down, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion that Paul should be kept in custody and should have some privileges, and not to forbid any of his friends to serve him or to visit him. But after some days, Felix came with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul, and heard him concerning the faith in Christ Jesus as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was terrified and answered, Go your way for this time, and when it is convenient for me, I will summon you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore also he sent for him more often and talked with him. But when two years were fulfilled, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and, desiring to gain favor with the Jews, Felix left Paul in bonds. Chapter 25 Festus, therefore, having come into the province, after three days went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. Then the high priest and the principal men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they begged him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem, plotting to kill him on the way. However, Festus answered that Paul should be kept in custody at Caesarea, and that he himself was about to depart shortly. Let them, therefore, he said, that are in power among you go down with me, and if there is anything wrong in the man, let them accuse him. When he had stayed among them more than ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and on the next day he sat on the judgment seat and commanded Paul to be brought. When he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing against him many and grievous charges which they could not prove, while he said in his defense, Neither against the law of the Jews nor against the temple nor against Caesar have I sinned at all. But Festus, desiring to gain favor with the Jews, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem 
and be judged by me there concerning these things? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also know very well. For if I have done wrong and have committed anything worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. But if none of those things is true that they accuse me of, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. Now when some days had passed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. As he stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, asking for a sentence against him. I answered them that it is not the custom of the Romans to give up any man to destruction before the accused has met the accusers face to face and has had opportunity to make his defense concerning the matter laid against him. When, therefore, they had come together here, I didn't delay, but on the next day sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charges against him of such things as I supposed, but had certain questions against him about their own religion and about one Jesus, who was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Being perplexed how to inquire concerning these things, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be kept for the decision of the emperor, I commanded him to be kept until I could send him to Caesar. Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So on the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp, and they had entered into the place of hearing with the commanding officers and the principal men of the city, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and as he himself appealed to the emperor, I determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write to my lord. Therefore, I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, that after examination I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to also specify the charges against him. Chapter 26 Agrippa said to Paul, You may speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, that I am to make my defense before you today concerning all the things that I am accused by the Jews especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. Indeed, all the Jews know my way of life from my youth up, which was from the beginning among my own nation and at Jerusalem, having known me from the first, if they are willing to testify, that after the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee, now I stand here to be judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, which our twelve tribes, earnestly serving night and day, hope to attain. Concerning this hope, I am accused by the Jews, King Agrippa. Why is it judged incredible with you if God does raise the dead? I myself most certainly thought that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I also did this in Jerusalem. I both shut up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my vote against them. 
punishing them often in all the synagogues, I tried to make them blaspheme. Being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities, whereupon, as I traveled to Damascus with the authority and commission from the chief priests, at noon, O king, I saw on the way a light from the sky, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who traveled with me. When we had all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you a servant and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will reveal to you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles to whom I send you, to open their eyes, that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive remission of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to them of Damascus, at Jerusalem, and throughout all the country of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, doing works worthy of repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Having therefore obtained the help that is from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would happen, how the Christ must suffer, and how by the resurrection of the dead he would be first to proclaim light both to these people and to the Gentiles. As he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are crazy. Your great learning is driving you insane. But he said, I am not crazy, most excellent Festus, but boldly declare words of truth and reasonableness. For the king knows of these things, to whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things is hidden from him for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, With a little persuasion, are you trying to make me a Christian? Paul said, I pray to God that whether with little or with much, not only you, but also all that hear me today, might become such as I am, except for these bonds. The king rose up with the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. When they had withdrawn, they spoke to one another, saying, This man does nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Chapter 27 when it was determined that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners to a centurion named Julius of the Augustan band. Embarking in a ship of Adramidium, which was about to sail to places on the coast of Asia, we put to sea, Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. The next day we touched at Sidon, Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him permission to go to his friends and refresh himself. Putting to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed across the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days, and had come with difficulty opposite Nidus, the wind not allowing us further, we sailed under the lee of Crete, opposite Salmoni. With difficulty sailing along it, we came to a certain place called Fair Havens, near the city of Lycia. When much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous, 
because the fast had now already gone by, Paul admonished them and said to them, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion gave more heed to the master and to the owner of the ship than to those things which were spoken by Paul. Because the haven was not suitable to enter in, the majority advised going to sea from there, if by any means they could reach Phoenix and winter there, which is a port of Crete, looking southwest and northwest. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to shore. But before long, a stormy wind beat down from shore, which is called Eurachlodon. When the ship was caught and couldn't face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Clauda, we were able, with difficulty, to secure the boat. After they had hoisted it up, they used cables to help reinforce the ship. Fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis sandbars, they lowered the sea anchor and so were driven along. As we labored exceedingly with the storm, the next day they began to throw things overboard. On the third day, they threw out the ship's tackle with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars shone on us for many days, and no small storm pressed on us, all hope that we would be saved was now taken away. When they had been long without food, Paul stood up in the middle of them and said, Sirs, you should have listened to me, and not have set sail from Crete, and have gotten this injury and loss. Now I exhort you to cheer up, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel, belonging to the God whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Don't be afraid, Paul, you must stand before Caesar. Behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, sirs, cheer up, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it has been spoken to me. But we must run aground on a certain island. But when the fourteenth night had come, as we were driven back and forth in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors surmised that they were drawing near to some land. They took soundings and found twenty fathoms. After a little while, they took soundings again and found fifteen fathoms. Fearing that we would run aground on rocky ground, they let go four anchors from the stern and wished for daylight. As the sailors were trying to flee out of the ship and had lured the boat into the sea, pretending that they would lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these stay in the ship, you can't be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the boat and let it fall off. While the day was coming on, Paul begged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you wait and continue fasting, having taken nothing. Therefore I beg you to take some food, for this is for your safety, for not a hair will perish from any of your heads. When he had said this and had taken bread, he gave thanks to God in the presence of all. Then he broke it and began to eat. Then they all cheered up, and they also took food. In all, we were 276 souls on the ship. When they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. When it was day, they didn't recognize the land, but they noticed a certain bay with a beach, and they decided to try to drive the ship onto it. Casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, at the same time untying the rudder ropes. Hoisting up the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But coming to a place where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground. The bow struck and remained immovable, but the stern began to break up by the violence of the waves. The soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim out and escape. But the centurion, 
desiring to save Paul, stopped them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should throw themselves overboard first to go toward the land, and the rest should follow, some on planks and some on other things from the ship. So they all escaped safely to the land. Chapter 28 When we had escaped, then they learned that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us uncommon kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us all, because of the present rain and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he has escaped from the sea, yet justice has not allowed to live. However, he shook off the creature into the fire and wasn't harmed. But they expected that he would have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But when they watched for a long time and saw nothing bad happen to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island, named Publius, who received us and courteously entertained us for three days. The father of Publius lay sick of fever and dysentery. Paul entered into him, prayed, and laying his hands on him, healed him. Then when this was done, the rest also who had diseases in the island came and were cured. They also honored us with many honors, and when we sailed, they put on board the things that we needed. After three months, we set sail in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the island, whose sign was the Twin Brothers. Touching at Syracuse, we stayed there three days. From there, we circled around and arrived at Regium. After one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day we came to Puteoli, where we found brothers, and were entreated to stay with them for seven days. So we came to Rome. From there the brothers, when they heard of us, came to meet us as far as the market of Appius and the three taverns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. When we entered into Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. After three days, Paul called together those who were leaders of the Jews. When they had come together, he said to them, I, brothers, though I had done nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, still was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, desired to set me free, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was constrained to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything about which to accuse my nation. For this cause, therefore, I asked to see you and to speak with you, for because of the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. They said to him, We neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor did any of the brothers come here and report or speak any evil of you. But we desire to hear from you what you think. For as concerning this sect, it is known to us that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed him a day, many people came to him at his lodging. He explained to them, testifying about God's kingdom and persuading them concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets, from morning until evening. Some believed the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. When they didn't agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had spoken one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, In hearing you will hear, 
but will in no way understand. In seeing, you will see, but will in no way perceive. For this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and would turn again. Then I would heal them. Be it known, therefore, to you, that the salvation of God is sent to the nations, and they will listen. When he had said these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house, and received all who were coming to him, preaching God's kingdom, and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, without hindrance. Romans Chapter 1 Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the good news of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of the offspring of David according to the flesh, who was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we received grace and apostleship for obedience of faith among all the nations for his name's sake, among whom you are also called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you that your faith is proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit in the good news of his Son. How unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers, requesting if by any means, now at last, I may be prospered by the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, to the end that you may be established, that is, that I with you may be encouraged in you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Now I don't desire to have you unaware, brothers, that I often planned to come to you, and was hindered so far, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am debtor both to Greeks and to foreigners, both to the wise and to the foolish. So as much as is in me, I am eager to preach the good news to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the good news of Christ, because it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it is revealed God's righteousness from faith to faith, as it is written, But the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known of God is revealed in them. For God revealed it to them, for the invisible things of him since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being perceived through the things that are made, even his everlasting power and divinity, that they may be without excuse, because, knowing God, they didn't glorify him as God, and didn't give thanks, but became vain in their reasoning, and their senseless heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and traded the glory of the incorruptible God for the likeness of an image of corruptible man and of birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to uncleanness, that their bodies should be dishonored among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, 
God gave them up to vile passions. For their women changed the natural function into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural function of the woman, burned in their lust toward one another, men doing what is inappropriate with men, and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. Even as they refused to have God in their knowledge, God gave them up to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil habits, secret slanderers, backbiters, hateful to God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Chapter 2 Therefore you are without excuse, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. We know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Do you think this, O man who judges those who practice such things and do the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and patience, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But according to your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath, revelation, and of the righteous judgment of God, who will pay back to everyone according to their works, to those who by perseverance and well-doing seek for glory, honor, and incorruptibility, eternal life. But to those who are self-seeking and don't obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, will be wrath, indignation, oppression, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace go to every man who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. As many as have sinned unto the law will be judged by the law. For it isn't the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who don't have the law do by nature the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience testifying with them and their thoughts among themselves, accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men, according to my good news by Jesus Christ, indeed, you bear the name of a Jew, rest on the law, glory in God, know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide of the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of babies, having in the law the form of knowledge and of the truth. You, therefore, who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach that a man shouldn't steal, do you steal? You who say a man shouldn't commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who glory in the law, do you dishonor God by disobeying the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. For circumcision indeed profits if you are a doer of the law, but if you are a transgressor of the law, 
your circumcision has become uncircumcision. If, therefore, the uncircumcised keep the ordinances of the law, won't his uncircumcision be accounted as circumcision? Won't the uncircumcision, which is, by nature, if it fulfills the law, judge you, who, with the letter and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Chapter 3 Then what advantage does the Jew have? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way. Because, first of all, they were entrusted with the revelations of God. For what if some were without faith? Will their lack of faith nullify the faithfulness of God? May it never be. Yes, let God be found true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that you might be justified in your words and might prevail when you come into judgment. But if our unrighteousness commends the righteousness of God, what will we say? Is God unrighteous who inflicts wrath? I speak like men do. May it never be. For then, how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God through my lie abounded to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? Why not, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let's do evil, that good may come. Those who say so are justly condemned. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no way. For we previously warned both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. They have all turned away. They have together become unprofitable. There is no one who does good, no, not so much as one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of vipers is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they haven't known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever things the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be brought under the judgment of God, because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin, but now apart from the law a righteousness of God has been revealed, being testified by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent to be an atoning sacrifice through faith in his blood, for a demonstration of his righteousness through the passing over of prior sins in God's forbearance, to demonstrate his righteousness at this present time, that he might himself be just and the justifier of him who has faith in Jesus. Where then is the boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. We maintain, therefore, that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Isn't he the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith 
and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. No, we establish the law. Chapter 4 What then will we say that Abraham, our forefather, has found, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not toward God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the reward is not counted as grace, but as something owed. But to him who doesn't work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Even as David also pronounces blessing on the man to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will by no means charge with sin. Is this blessing then pronounced on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it counted? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while he was in uncircumcision that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they might be in uncircumcision, that righteousness might also be accounted to them. He is the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had in uncircumcision. For the promise to Abraham and to his offspring that he should be heir of the world wasn't through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is made of no effect. For the law produces wrath. For where there is no law, neither is there disobedience. For this cause it is of faith, that it may be according to grace, to the end that the promise may be sure to all the offspring, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. This is in the presence of him whom he believed. God, who gives life to the dead and calls the things that are not as though they were. Besides hope, Abraham in hope believed to the end that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken. So will your offspring be. Without being weakened in faith, he didn't consider his own body, already having been worn out, he being about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, looking to the promise of God, he didn't waver through unbelief, but grew strong through faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Therefore it also was credited to him for righteousness. Now it was not written that it was accounted to him for his sake alone, but for our sake also, to whom it will be accounted, who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Chapter 5 Being, therefore, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have our access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God, not only this, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character, hope, and hope doesn't disappoint us, 
because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were yet weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, yet perhaps for a righteous person someone would even dare to die. But God commends his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we will be saved from God's wrath through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we will be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, as sin entered into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death passed to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not charged when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those whose sins weren't like Adam's disobedience, who is a foreshadowing of him who was to come. But the free gift isn't like the trespass. For if by the trespass of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not as through one who sinned, for the judgment came by one to condemnation, but the free gift came of many trespasses to justification. For if by the trespass of the one, death reigned through the one, so much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one trespass all men were condemned, even so, through one act of righteousness, all men were justified to life. For as through the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, many will be made righteous. The law came in that the trespass might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded more exceedingly. That as sin reigned in death, even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 6 What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. We who died to sin, how could we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we will also be part of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be in bondage to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. But if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin one time, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Thus, consider yourselves also to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Also, do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. 
for sin will not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Don't you know that when you present yourselves as servants and obey someone, you are the servants of whomever you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness? But thanks be to God that whereas you were bondservants of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were delivered. Being made free from sin, you became bondservants of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For as you presented your members as servants to uncleanness and to wickedness upon wickedness, even so now, Present your members as servants to righteousness for sanctification. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit then did you have at that time in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and having become servants of God, you have your fruit of sanctification and the result of eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Chapter 7 Or don't you know, brothers, for I speak to men who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man for as long as he lives? For the woman that has a husband is bound by law to the husband while he lives. But if the husband dies, she is discharged from the law of the husband. So then, if while the husband lives, she is joined to another man, she would be called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brothers, you also were made dead to the law through the body of Christ that you would be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might produce fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were through the law worked in our members to bring out fruit to death. But now we have been discharged from the law, having died to that in which we were held, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. However, I wouldn't have known sin except through the law, for I wouldn't have known coveting unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, finding occasion through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of coveting, for apart from the law, sin is dead. I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. The commandment, which was for life, this I found to be for death. For sin, finding occasion through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. Therefore, the law indeed is holy, and the commandment holy and righteous and good. Did then that which is good become death to me? May it never be. But sin, that it might be shown to be sin, was producing death in me through that which is good, that through the commandment sin might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly, sold under sin. For I don't know what I'm doing, for I don't practice what I desire to do, but what I hate, that I do. But if what I don't desire, that I do, I consent to the law that it is good. So now it is no more I that do it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For a desire is present with me, but I don't find it doing that which is good. For the good which I desire, I don't do. But the evil which I don't desire, that I practice. 
But if what I don't desire, that I do, it is no more I that do it, but sin which dwells in me. I find, then, the law that to me, while I desire to do good, evil is present. For I delight in God's law after the inward man, but I see a different law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity under the law of sin which is in my members. What a wretched man I am! Who will deliver me out of the body of this death? I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve God's law, but with the flesh, sin's law. Chapter 8 There is, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit, of life in Christ Jesus, made me free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law couldn't do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the ordinance of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind of the flesh is hostile toward God, for it is not subject to God's law, neither indeed can it be. Those who are in the flesh can't please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if it is so that the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if any man doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are children of God. For you didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. and. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed toward us. For the creation waits with eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to vanity, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of decay into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now, not only so, but ourselves also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for that which he sees? But if we hope for that which we don't see, we wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which can't be uttered. 
He who searches the hearts knows what is on the Spirit's mind, because he makes intercession for the saints according to God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Whom he predestined, those he also called. Whom he called, those he also justified. Whom he justified, those he also glorified. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how would he not also with him freely give us all things? Who could bring a charge against God's chosen ones? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Yes, rather, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Could oppression, or anguish, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Even as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We were accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from God's love which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Chapter 9 I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifying with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing pain in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brother's sake, my relatives according to the flesh, who are Israelites, whose is the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom is Christ, as concerning the flesh, who is over all, God, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has come to nothing, for they are not all Israel that are of Israel. Neither, because they are Abraham's offspring, are they all children. But your offspring will be accounted as from Isaac. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as heirs. For this is a word of promise. At the appointed time, I will come, and Sarah will have a son. Not only so. But Rebekah also conceived by one, by our father Isaac. For being not yet born, neither having done anything good or bad, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, The elder will serve the younger. Even as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau, I hate it. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? May it never be. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I caused you to be raised up, that I might show in you my power, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens 
whom he desires. You will say then to me, Why does he still find fault? For who withstands his will? But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed ask him who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Or hasn't the potter a right over the clay from the same lump to make one part a vessel for honor and another for a dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory? us whom he also called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, who was not beloved. It will be that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. Isaiah cries concerning Israel. If the number of the children of Israel are as the sand of the sea, it is the remnant who will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. As Isaiah has said before, unless the Lord of armies had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and would have been made like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, who didn't follow after righteousness, attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, but Israel, following after a law of righteousness, didn't arrive at the law of righteousness. Why? Because they didn't seek it by faith, but as it were by works of the law. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, even as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and no one who believes in him will be disappointed. Chapter 10 Brothers, my heart's desire and my prayer to God is for Israel, that they may be saved. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they didn't subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness of the law. The one who does them will live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith says this, Don't say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or, Who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, For the same Lord is Lord of all, and is rich to all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they didn't all listen to the glad news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes by hearing, 
and hearing by the word of God. But I say, didn't they hear? Yes, most certainly. Their sound went out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, didn't Israel know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy with that which is no nation. I will make you angry with a nation void of understanding. Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who didn't seek me. I was revealed to those who didn't ask for me. But about Israel, he says, All day long I stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Chapter 11 I ask then, did God reject his people? May it never be, for I also am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God didn't reject his people, which he foreknew. Or don't you know what the scripture says about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have broken down your altars. I am left alone, and they seek my life. But how does God answer him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. What then? That which Israel seeks for, that he didn't obtain, but the chosen ones obtained it, and the rest were hardened, according as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, to this very day. David says, Let their table be made a snare, a trap, a stumbling block, and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see. Always keep their backs bent. I ask then, did they stumble that they might fall? May it never be. But by their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if their fall is the riches of the world and their loss the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you who are Gentiles. Since then, as I am an apostle to Gentiles, I glorify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and may save some of them, for if the rejection of them is the reconciling of the world, what would their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first fruit is holy, so is the lump. If the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them, and became partaker with them of the root and of the richness of the olive tree, don't boast over the branches. But if you boast, it is not you who support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. True, by their unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by your faith. Don't be conceited, but fear. For if God didn't spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. See then the goodness and severity of God. Toward those who fail, severity. But toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. They also, if they don't continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of that which is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grafted, contrary to nature, into a good olive tree, how much more will these, which are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? 
For I don't desire you to be ignorant, brothers, of this mystery, so that you won't be wise in your own conceits, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. Even as it is written, there will come out of Zion the Deliverer, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them, when I will take away their sins. Concerning the good news, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you in time past were disobedient to God, but now have obtained mercy by their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient, that by the mercy shown to you they may also obtain mercy. For God has bound all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past tracing out! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has first given to him, and it will be repaid to him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory for ever. Amen. Chapter 12 Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the good, well-pleasing, and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace that was given me, to every man who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think reasonably, as God has apportioned to each person a measure of faith. For even as we have many members in one body, and all the members don't have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts differing according to the grace that was given to us, if prophecy, let's prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. Or service, let's give ourselves to service. Or he who teaches, to his teaching. Or he who exhorts, to his exhorting. He who gives, let him do it with generosity. He who rules, with diligence. He who shows mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. Cling to that which is good. In love of the brothers, be tenderly affectionate to one another. In honor, preferring one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Enduring in troubles. Continuing steadfastly in prayer contributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and don't curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Don't set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Don't be wise in your own conceits. Repay no one evil for evil. Respect what is honorable in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it is up to you, be at peace with all men. Don't seek revenge yourselves, beloved, but give place to God's wrath. For it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, Give him a drink, for in doing so you will heap coals of fire on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
Chapter 13 Let every soul be in subjection to the higher authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those who exist are ordained by God. Therefore, he who resists the authority withstands the ordinance of God, and those who withstand will receive to themselves judgment. For rulers are not a terror to the good work, but to the evil. Do you desire to have no fear of the authority? Do that which is good, and you will have praise from the authority, for he is a servant of God to you, for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid, for he doesn't bear the sword in vain, for he is a servant of God, an avenger for wrath to him who does evil. Therefore, you need to be in subjection, not only because of the wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For this reason you also pay taxes, for they are servants of God's service, continually doing this very thing. Therefore, give everyone what you owe. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If customs, then customs. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandments there are, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love doesn't harm a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Do this, knowing the time, that it is already time for you to awaken out of sleep, for salvation is now nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone, and the day is near. Let's, therefore, throw off the deeds of darkness, and let's put on the armor of light. Let's walk properly as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and lustful acts, and not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, for its lusts. Chapter 14 Now accept one who is weak in faith, but not for disputes over opinions. One man has faith to eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Don't let him who eats despise him who doesn't eat. Don't let him who doesn't eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you who judge another's servant? To his own Lord he stands or falls. Yes, he will be made to stand, for God has power to make him stand. One man esteems one day as more important, another esteems every day alike. Let each man be fully assured in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. He who doesn't eat to the Lord he doesn't eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and none dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. Or if we die, we die to the Lord. If therefore we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died, rose, and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, to me every knee will bow, every tongue will confess to God. So then each one of us will give account of himself to God. Therefore, Let's not judge one another any more, but judge this rather, 
that no man put a stumbling block in his brother's way or an occasion for falling. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean of itself except that to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if because of food your brother is grieved, you walk no longer in love. Don't destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Then don't let your good be slandered, for God's kingdom is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let's follow after things which make for peace and things by which we may build one another up. Don't overthrow God's work for food's sake. All things indeed are clean. However, it is evil for that man who creates a stumbling block by eating. It is good to not eat meat, drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, is offended, or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who doesn't judge himself in that which he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because it isn't of faith, and whatever is not of faith is sin. Now, to him who is able to establish you according to my good news and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret through long ages, but now is revealed, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, is made known for obedience of faith to all the nations. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. End of section 82.